The subcommittee will come to order without objection. The chair is authorized to declare recesses of the subcommittee at any time. We welcome everyone to this morning's hearing. An unending crisis, essential steps to reducing gun violence and mass shootings. Before we begin, I would like to remind members that we have established an email address and distribution list dedicated to circulating exhibits, motions, or other written materials that members might want to offer as part of our hearing today. If you would like to submit materials, please send them to the email address that has been previously distributed to your offices, and we will circulate the materials to members and staff as quickly as we can. I would also ask all members to mute your microphones when you are not speaking. This will help prevent feedback and other technical issues. You may unmute yourself anytime you seek recognition, and as well, uh, when you're speaking, you may not have your mask. I will now recognize myself for an ongoing um, uh, of this hearing for an opening statement. We're here today on May 20th, 2021, when throughout America, states have rates of death by guns of 12, 15, 22% of our population. America still remains as the battlefront of guns. The state of Texas, the governor just signed a permitless law that anyone without the permission of that business, that church, that doctor's office, that school, at least by perceived by the public. Whatever fine points have been made, the public doesn't read it. They just say it's a free-for-all. In the backdrop of the tragedy of El Paso, 22 of our fellow Texans were killed because someone said they didn't like Mexicans. So today the subcommittee turns to the all too commonplace tragedy that is gun violence. In the time since our committee last held a hearing focused on gun violence, many more Americans' lives have been heartbreakingly and unnecessarily lost to gunfire. Current circumstances have exacerbated the problem. During the pandemic, gun sales have surged with more children at home with firearms that have not been properly secured. As late or as many years back, when I served on the Houston City Council, the first gun law they ever passed was the requirement that parents would be responsible for securing their guns because two-year-olds were being shot by guns that they found in the home. On top of these frightening dynamics, there has been an uptick in firearm fuel violent crime that has left families and communities torn and afraid. Statistics are sobering. On average, 316 people are shot every day, with over 100 killed and 64 dying by suicide. What about a city that lives through drive-by shootings, rage on the road? They don't wave their fists. They shoot out the window. They shoot seven-year-olds, two-year-olds, elderly persons, mothers, fathers, families. While official numbers have not been compiled, one study found that gun homicides and non-suicide-related shootings took approximately 19,000 lives, 25% increase from 2019. Texas had over 3,000 deaths. The same study on gun deaths estimates that likely exceeded 40,000. This grim number would mean that 2020 had the highest rate of gun deaths in the last two decades. Each one of these deaths leaves a hole in the fabric of their family and community, and particularly our children. As with so many other tragedies, children often bear the brunt of gun violence. On a daily basis, eight children are victims of fa family fire due to an improperly stored or misused gun in their home. Today, guns account for half of all suicide death. That should appall us so much. In the majority of children's gun suicides, the guns were stored in the child's place of residence or the residence of a relative or friend. Yes, child suicides with guns. We cannot allow this to continue in our country. That is why safe storage of guns is critical to our public safety and why I introduced the Kimberly Vaughn Firearm Safe Storage Act. 
My bill would regulate the proper storage of firearms and ammunition for residences with children under the age of 18 or a residence with a person who is ineligible to own a firearm. I hope members will join me and co-sponsor this life-saving legislation. And I hope members from both sides of the aisle. I also hope that members of this committee will answer President Biden's call to address community violence through intervention and health infrastructure investment. We're delighted that this Congress voted to allow the Centers for Disease Control to establish gun violence as a national health issue. We must pursue creative solutions to the problem of gun violence on our streets and in our neighborhoods and in every part of this country in all too frequent bases. Another threat to our communities that we will discuss today is ghost guns. Ghost guns are firearms constructed with component parts that can be obtained anonymously without a background check and lack serial numbers. Ghost guns are essentially untraceable. The absence of a manufacturing record, serial number, or background check is essentially exactly what makes them the perfect guns to commit crimes. These weapons, ghost guns, pose a new and growing threat to the safety of our brave men and women of law enforcement. I didn't state earlier that the Texas law enforcement were against permitless guns. I think if you're for law enforcement, you gotta be for law enforcement. Increasingly, gangs, drug dealers, and other nefarious individuals are assembling their own untraceable firearms for their illicit activity. In 2020 alone, the Los Angeles Police Department recovered more than 600 ghost guns, at least 231 of which were used in serious or violent crimes such as murder and attempted murder and kidnapping, and 145 of which were recovered from felons who are prohibited from owning or possessing guns. Ghost guns are a clear and present threat to public safety, and it is imperative that we take action now. We cannot continue to live in a society where we uh, where you could be a victim to gun violence just by going to the school, the movies, uh, the musical festivals, and even grocery shopping. I'm committed to ending the scourge of gun violence in this country. And for many who are in this room, uh, some of us were here as Columbine hit the nation, and the commitment then was to stop gun violence. We must do more to address what is an issue of life and death for far too many Americans. We must complete this work and we have started on legislation that we know will work. Therefore, I call on the Senate to now pass the bipartisan background check and Charleston loophole bills passed out of this House under the leadership of Chairman Navlin. I urge the Senate to pass the Violence Against Women Act, which contains a provision that would bar, position, uh, bar uh, the use of a firearm for those who are convicted of a misdemeanor stalking. I was glad to lead that bill uh, as it came out of this committee. At the same time, we're in the House must consider additional legislation to provide common sense solutions to the scourge of gun violence and suicides. That is why our discussion will be so important today. But this discussion, members, and I thank you for your presence here, should be a call to action and a call to do. We must do and we have to do it now. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on these critical issues, and it certainly is my pleasure now to recognize uh, the ranking member's opening statement. Mr. Biggs, you're recognized for your time. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and good morning. Good morning to you. Thank you very much. I express my sincerest condolences to those present who have lost a loved one to a senseless act of violence. And I hope today we can have an open and honest dialogue about the firearms my colleagues wish to prohibit law-abiding Americans from possessing. I hope that we can avoid any inaccuracy, mischaracterization, and outright falsehoods that have plagued this dialogue for decades, actually. Unfortunately, many in the American public, the media, and shockingly, this very body regularly engage in the peddling of inaccuracies. Earlier, th earlier this year, one member of this committee, who is the lead sponsor of the so-called assault weapon ban, conflated the terms assault rifle and assault weapon multiple times in a dear colleague letter seeking support for the bill. Assault rifles are rapid-fire magazine-fed rifles designed for military use. They are shoulder-fired weapons that allow the shooter to select between settings semi-automatic and fully automatic, which allows the operator to hold the trigger as the gun fires continuously or in three-shot bursts. Assault rifles are subject to regulation under the National Firearms Act, and as such, they are functionally illegal and rarely used in crimes. Assault weapons, on the other hand, have been defined in statute and legislation as semi automatic firearms. Um, a year ago, a member of this committee said just outside this hearing room that, 
quote, I've held an AR-15 in my hand. I wish I hadn't. It is as heavy as 10 boxes that you might be moving, and the bullet that is utilized, a 50 caliber, these kinds of bullets need to be licensed and do not need to be on the street, close quote. An AR-15 weighs between 6 and 7 pounds and fires a 223 or 9 millimeter round of ammunition. It does not fire a 50 caliber ammunition. I would hope that these inaccuracies are just a, a case of members not taking the time to educate themselves on these issues. I would note, however, that the push to ban so-called assault weapons was born on the, uh, of the idea to mislead Americans. In 1988, the Violence Policy Center released a study entitled Assault Weapons and Accessories in America. In it, they state, quote, assault weapons just like armor-piercing bullets, machine guns, and plastic firearms are a new topic. The weapon's menacing looks, coupled with the public's confusion over fully automatic machine guns versus semi-automatic assault weapons, anything that looks like a machine gun is assumed to be a machine gun, can only increase the chance of public support for restrictions on these weapons, close quote. But let's look at the statistics. In 2019, according to the FBI, there were 364 murders committed with all rifles, not just those deemed to be some uh, assault weapons. By comparison, knives or other cutting instruments were used in 1,476 murders. Blunt objects such as clubs, hammers, and bats were used in 397 murders, and hands and feet were used in 600 murders. The fact is that so-called assault weapons and high-capacity magazines have been used often in self-defense situations. The Supreme Court of the United States has recognized the right to self-defense. In District of Columbia versus Heller, the court ruled that the inherent right of self-defense has been central to the Second Amendment right, which is the individualized right to possess and carry weapons in case of confrontation, including all instruments that constitute bearable arms. Stephen Williford and his AR-15 helped stop the deadliest mass shooting in Texas history in 2017. Mr. Williford has, was able to confront and shoot Devin Kelly, who had just fatally shot 26 people in the First Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs, Texas. After Mr. Williford pursued and shot Kelly, Kelly ended up taking his own life. Mr. Williford likely prevented further casualties and was hailed a hero by, by local law enforcement. Similarly, high-capacity magazines have played a role in self-defense. On April 15, 2018, a Glen St. Mary, Florida resident awoke at 4 a.m. to a home invasion that was motivated by an apparent Facebook dispute. Seven masked and armed individuals forced their way into a mobile home where one of the residents was armed with an AR-15. According to reports, the resident fired more than 30 rounds during the event, resulting in one home invader being killed and others being wounded. These are just two of many examples of Americans exercising their constitutional rights to self-defense with assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. Further, the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, Congress required ju the Justice Department to examine the effects of the assault weapons ban. The mandated study of the Federal Assault Weapon and High Capacity Magazine ban concluded that, quote, the banned guns were never used in more than a modest fraction of all gun murders, close quote, before the ban. And the ban's 10-round limit on new magazines was not a factor in multiple victim or multiple wound crimes. A follow-up study in 2004 concluded that so-called assault weapons and high capacity magazines were used in only a minority of gun crimes prior to the 1994 federal ban. Relatively few attacks involve more than 10 shots fired and the ban's effects on gun violence are likely to be small at best and perhaps too small for reliable measurement. Democrats would also like to implement red flag laws known as extreme risk protection orders, allow law enforcement, which allow law enforcement family members or others with close relationships to the individual to petition a state court to temporarily remove firearms from an individual who they believe to present a danger to themselves or others. These laws trample on an individual's due process and Second Amendment rights because they permit the seizure of an individual's firearm or ammunition before the individual is given an opportunity to be heard in court. Typically, in order to deny a fundamental constitutional right, an individual must be afforded notice and an opportunity to be heard and present evidence. What other constitutional rights are my Democrat colleagues willing to take away without due process? I urge my colleagues to learn more about the rights they're seeking to abridge. And finally, let's look at the Biden administration's nominee to lead the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, David Chipman. Since Mr. Chip Chipman left ATF in 2012, he has made his money lobbying for failed gun control policies, first for Michael Bloomberg, then for the Giffords Law Center. While at ATF, then Agent Chipman was the case agent for the Branch Davidian trial, according to his biography that he submitted to this committee last Congress. As I'm sure everyone knows, 76 men, women, and children were killed in that botched raid. Years later, while pushing for more gun control, Mr. Chipman allegedly claimed, falsely claimed, that Branch Davidian shot down two Texas Air National Guard helicopters with 50 caliber rounds during the 51-day siege. 
In two reports, one issued jointly by this committee and the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight, and one issued solely by the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight, there is no mention of a single helicopter being downed. In the report to the Deputy Attorney General on the events at Waco, Texas, there is no mention of a helicopter being downed by any gunfire. It appears Mr. Chipman pulled the story out of thin air to justify gun control. The job of the ATF director is to enforce the laws Congress passes, this body passes, not promote failed gun policies. I am, Madam Chair, I do have a number of articles that I will submit into the record, but I don't want to further delay the start of this, so I'm going to wait until the end if that's all right with you, and I think it'd be more convenient. Um, and with all due respect to you and your position as chair of the submit committee and understanding that you are given wide latitude, and I respect that latitude in our rules, I re regret, however, to report that I have noticed a starting propensity for the chair to take time after many of my Republican colleagues a uh, period of questioning and occasionally after the witnesses as well. I realize that you, that you do have that great latitude that are given in the rules, but out of fairness, I request that if you do take that privilege that perhaps you would grant the member equal time for a rebuttal or clarification uh, related to the comments uh, you make or grant me time to comment uh, on the statements that uh, are and questions that are made by Democrats as well. But with that, I do look forward to hearing from witnesses, uh, witnesses today, a robust debate. And with that, Madam Chair, I would gratefully yield, yield back. Oh, yes, I will yield to you, Madam uh, Chair. I thank the gentleman for his uh, inquiry and his comment. It is a prerogative of the chair, of which I will continue with uh, discretion to utilize. But as you recall, in the last hearing, um, we allowed uh, you to uh, have a response, and I will continue to do so. Um, absolute inaccuracy sometimes requires for a correction of the record but the ranking uh, will have an opportunity appropriately if that occurs uh, to make a clarification as well. And I thank you so very much for your generosity and uh, your interest in this hearing and this topic. Uh, it is now thank my you. pleasure. Yield back. Th thank you so very much. Uh, it's now my pleasure to recognize the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Mr. Nadler, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you very much. I thank Chairwoman, Ch chairwoman Jackson Lee for convening this hearing. I thank the witnesses for being here to inform this committee on how we can develop additional solutions to promote firearm safety. For well over a year now, America has grappled with two public health crises, the COVID-19 pandemic and an epidemic of gun violence. No place is immune from the effects of gun violence, including our homes, our streets, our schools, and even our places of worship. The uncertainty of the pandemic has driven thousands of Americans to gun stores with record numbers of first-time buyers bringing firearms into their homes. The FBI background check system has been overwhelmed by the demand, delaying investigations and resulting in potentially hundreds of thousands of people buying firearms without a completed background check. And while every nation has struggled with the effects of the pandemic, only one, the United States, has had such an accompanying surge of gun violence. Even before COVID-19, a country-to-country -country comparison of gun violence was shocking. A recent study in the American Journal of Medicine found that compared to 29 other high-income countries, the gun-related murder rate in the United States is 25 times higher. Even when you adjust for population differences, Americans are disproportionately killed by gun violence. One of the critical differences, of course, is that other countries have stronger gun safety laws. The House has already passed two sensible firearm measures, uh, Congressman Mike Thompson's bipartisan background check bill and Majority Whip Clyburn's bill to help close the Charleston loophole. The House has done its part. Now it's time for Senate Republicans to allow these bills to pass so that they may, come, so that they may, may become law. Today, I hope this panel will examine another reasonable measure to help prevent gun violence, extreme risk protection orders, or ERPOs. These laws allow just law enforcement, and depending on the jurisdiction, family members, health professionals, and school administrators to ask a court to prevent the person who is at risk of violence to self or to others from purchasing or possessing firearms. In ERPO hearings, law enforcement and family members provide evidence in an ex parte proceeding during which a neutral federal judge weighs, in, weighs on whether a threat is imminent. Only if a finding of dangerous is made is a firearm owner temporarily deprived of their firearm. In California, 
One study found that extreme risk protection orders were issued in 21 instances where there is concern of a mass casualty event. These orders may have saved many lives. After Connecticut enacted an extreme risk protection order law, the state saw a 14% reduction in its firearm suicide rate. Indiana saw a 7.5% reduction in suicides in the 10 years after it enacted its ERPO law. The data supports the expansion of ERPOs. We must take up legislation on the federal level and pass it now. Another item I hope the witnesses will discuss is ghost guns. These weapons are kits that are up to 80% complete that can be finished at home. Sold as do-it-yourself projects, ghost guns do not currently have serial numbers or require a background check. Over the last three years, ghost guns have flooded the streets and now there are the plurality of guns involved in crimes in some jurisdictions. Because ghost guns do not have serial numbers, they're difficult to trace and make solving crime extremely challenging. The legislature in my home state of New York is in the midst of taking affirmative steps to address the proliferation of, guns, of ghost guns. Just this week, the New York legislature is considering the Scott J. Beigel Unfinished Receiver Act which would make it a felony to own or possess unfinished receivers or ghost guns. This legislation has already expressed the state Senate and the governor is expected to sign it. I support this effort and I hope that Congress can quickly move to address on a federal level the dangers that ghost guns present. Another urgent issue that we must address is the deadly toll of assault style weapons. These firearms are designed specifically for offensive operations, killing the most people in the shortest period of time possible, which is why they are the weapon of choice for those perpetrating the highest casualty mass shootings. The list goes on and on. Sandy Hook, Las Vegas, El Paso, Dayton, Sutherland Springs, Aurora, Orlando, Parkland, and most recently, Boulder. Hundreds of lives ended by individual shooters with assault weapons with friends and family left to grieve and pick up the pieces. Victims of mass shootings and everyday gun violence alike have tried and failed to hold gun makers and distributors accountable in court. Both the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, the, PLA, the PLCAA, and which was the top legislative priority of the corporate gun industry, has allowed the gun industry to evade fundamental civil justice and accountability at the expense of victims of gun violence. We must repeal PLCAA sweeping immunity from civil liability for the gun industry, which must be held to account for negligent conduct, defective products, and otherwise irresponsible behavior. I ask you, what other industry in the United States enjoys sweeping immunity for civil liability for its negligent acts? As we continue, as we consider these and other issues related to our crisis of gun violence, I thank the witnesses for coming today, and again, I express my gratitude to Chairwoman Sheila Jackson Lee for, converting, for convening this hearing. And before I yield back, I ask for unanimous consent for a letter from Linda Beigel Shulman, a leading gun safety prevention advocate in my home state of New York, describing efforts in New York to address the proliferation of ghost guns to be entered into the record. Without objection, Mr. Chairman, so ordered. I thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank you so very much for your testimony. I now recognize the distinguished ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today, and I, too, extend my uh, condolences to the families of those who've, uh, who've lost loved ones. Um, think about what the Democrats want to do. Step one, defund the police. Democrats here in Congress and Democrat mayors around the country demonizing, demoralizing our law enforcement officers and actually defunding police to the tune of over a billion dollars last year in, in all our major cities. And what's the result of that? Crime is up in every major city. Step two, release violent offenders from our prisons. Last year, Chairman Nadler introduced a bill to pay states and localities to empty their prisons and jails. The bill called for the release of violent offenders from state prisons and local jails, inmates were only deemed ineligible for release if they did, quote, not pose a risk of serious imminent injury to a reasonably identified person. In other words, it was okay to release inmates as long as they didn't pose an immediate risk to a specific individual. 
And now step three. Now the third part. Take away guns from law-abiding Americans so they can't defend themselves. This hearing today is, and the numerous bills introduced on our, by our Democrat colleagues make clear that they want to disarm law-abiding American citizens by depriving them of their constitutional rights. And none of these bills would have actually prevented any recent mass shooting. The, the chairman of the full committee just said in California, what I think he said 21 cases where they had extreme protection orders where they took someone's firearms from them. And he said that may have prevented crime. May have, we don't know. But what we do know is 21 citizens were denied their Second Amendment liberties by a proceeding where they couldn't even attend. Because that's what these red flag laws, these extreme protection orders do. The model legislation that the chairman's talking about pays states to set up a system where anyone can go to a court and say, I don't think so-and-so should have a firearm. There's a hearing where so-and-so, the one accused, the one who's going to lose their firearm, they don't even get to show up. It's ex parte hearing. They don't even get to show up. Then they take their firearm, and then they have to, as a, to, they have to go to court to get their right back, even though there was no proceeding where they could attend in the first place. And the standard for all this is lower, a lower standard, reasonable standard. This is dangerous path they want to go down. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, particularly the Republican witness. I am nervous about all the legislation being talked about on the other side. I hope we understand that the Second Amendment is right next to the first because it's pretty darn important. Madam Chair, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Thank him for his opening statement. We welcome all of our distinguished witnesses and we thank them for their participation. I will begin by swearing in our witnesses. I ask our witnesses to turn on their audio and make sure I can see your face and raise your hand. And those who are in the room, please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty or perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God. Yes. yes. I yes. can hear the audio. Can I hear the audio of witnesses? Yes. yes. Thank you so very much. You may be seated. Let the record show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative, and thank you. We'll now proceed with witness introductions. It really is my privilege to introduce um, a outstanding legislator uh, and uh, someone who has impacted uh, my community, even though she represents Austin, uh, because she has a strong uh, and committed uh, reputation for protecting the people of Texas. Representative Vicki Goodwin represents Texas House District 47 in the western and far south Travis County. That means she has some of Austin, Texas. Uh, many people know of the great tech revolution in Austin. She was a co-author of Landmark School Finance Reform, which probably gives her a great sense of protecting children uh, in the schoolhouse, as well as the law boosting retired teacher pay. Representative Goodwin is also a small business owner, a real estate broker, a mother, a graduate of the University of Texas, and she herself has confronted the evils of what a gun can do. I thank you so very much for being here today. Welcome. Uh, Fred Guttenberg, an author and gun safety advocate. His 14-year-old daughter, Jamie Guttenberg, was killed in the Stoneman Douglas High School shooting on February 14, 2018. His son, Jesse, was also a student at the school, ran from the shooting to meet him at a nearby store in addition to his activism, he is a small businessman in Parkland, Florida. He should, and I will personally thank him in his loss for what he has continued to do for this nation. That should be part of your portfolio, that you are in fact fighting for the survival of our nation. Thank you for being here today. Diana Muller is a two-time national three-gun champion and professional shooter. She is a retired 22-year veteran of the Tulsa Police Department, serving assignments in narcotics, gangs, street crimes, and patrol. She is also a law enforcement firearms instructor, a member of the NRA Law Enforcement Committee, 
and a subcommittee member of the Department of Interior Hunting and Shooting Sports Conservation Council. Ms. Muller is the founder of the DC Project. Thank you for being here. Now it's my privilege to be able to turn to my colleague uh, from Texas, who herself has spent time as a new member in the midst of tragedy in her city of El Paso, Texas. And I want to give her the privilege of introducing her constituents, Pastor Michael E. Grady. I yield to Congresswoman Escobar at this time. Madam Chair, thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be able to have the honor this morning to introduce my constituent, Pastor Michael Grady. Pastor Grady is a faith leader in El Paso at the Prince of Peace Christian Fellowship Church. His daughter, Michelle, was shot multiple times during the horrific El Paso terror attack in August 2019. Michelle survived, thank God, and spent 55 days in the hospital recovering. Since the incident, Pastor Grady has met with several people in his congregation who have also been affected by gun violence, and he has been an important voice on this and a number of other significant national issues. Pastor Grady, thank you for being here. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you so very much. May I remind the gentleman, uh, Congressman Massey, that in this room you must wear your mask, and thank you so very much for your courtesies of doing that. Um, we appreciate that very much. Anyone else, um, you can remove your mask when you are speaking. Thank you so very much. And I will get ready to speak, so I'll remove this mask as I'm putting it back on. Um, we have the privilege of having J. Adam Skaggs. And uh, he has uh, been just a um, established expert on really the responses to all of those who say, why? And he has been able to give us a credible uh, and detailed response of why not. He does that, I know, because he is associated with our beloved colleagues Law Center, the Giffords Law Center, and he is a chief counsel and policy director. Previously, he was senior counsel at Every Town for Gun Safety and at the Brennan Center for Justice, where he worked on election law issues. So, Skaggs, if you don't mind me at least taking note of Gabby Giffords and what her giant story has been able to do in setting up this law center by being a truth teller on gun violence and guns in America. You yourself was also a litigation associate at Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison, and a law clerk at the 11th Circuit in the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of New York. We welcome you. Please note that each of your written testimony statements will be entered into the record in its entirety. Uh, and let me say that uh, votes have been called, but there are two votes. We're going to take one or two witnesses and then recess members so that we can vote in a recess and vote for the second vote and come back as quickly as possible. We may get through two witnesses. Our staff is now trying to determine. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. There is a timer in the Zoom view uh, that should be viable on your screen. And Representative Goodwin, you may begin. And thank you again for being here. Welcome. Thank you, Chairwoman Jackson Lee. Ranking Member Biggs. Chairman if you can Biden. turn your sound up, please. Can you turn your sound up? Is that better? A little better. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chairwoman Jackson Lee, Ranking Member Biggs, Chairman Nadler, and Ranking Member Jordan. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the Crime, Terrorism, and Homeland Security Subcommittee. Would you suspend, uh, just suspend, we're trying to work on your sound here for a minute. Okay. Thank you, just a moment. Are we turning it? Or should we? Okay, we can push it back to five. Is it not good? Is it? We'll just do one witness uh, member, so please, um, are we turning her back to five? Pardon me? All right. 
Uh, Representative, can you continue, please? And thank you. Apologize for the technical. No problem. Yes, thank you again. My name is Vicki Goodwin. I represent Texas House District 47. Firearm safety issues are deeply personal to me and are a focus of my legislative work. I am a gun violence survivor. When I was in my early 20s, my father was shot and killed in our home in Dallas. My father's death profoundly impacted me and gives me a tremendous empathy for others who have lost loved ones to gun violence. Over the years, my sense of grief and sorrow has turned to a personal passion to work for my community and state on gun safety issues. I believe that the voices of gun violence victims and their families must be heard in the halls of power. I joined the Texas House Homeland Security and Public Safety Committee, which hears legislation on gun laws, so I can amplify the voices of victims and promote change. As a committee member, I've had the opportunity in recent months to weigh in on a dangerous piece of legislation in Texas, House Bill 1927. The bill would permit people to carry concealed loaded weapons in public spaces without passing any background or training requirement. Passage of this bill will significantly weaken protections and safeguards that are currently in place to protect communities from gun violence. Texas's firearms safety laws are already some of the weakest in the country. Texas's existing framework is already full of loopholes and encourages gun trafficking across state lines and into Mexico. At present, existing state law requires people to pass a background check and complete a basic safety training course to be licensed to carry loaded handguns in public places. House Bill 1927 will do away with that requirement. Alarmingly, Texas does not universally require people to pass a background check to purchase firearms. Legislation I filed this session attempted to close loopholes in the background check system, whether someone is purchasing guns at gun shows, online, or through other means. My background check bills did not make it out of committee. On the other hand, House Bill 1927 is on its way to becoming law, and it will make it impossible for our law enforcement to know if people carrying guns on our streets are in legal possession or not. It will make it easier for people who can't currently pass background checks to carry a firearm, including those with violent criminal histories or those suffering from chemical dependencies. The research is clear that flooding public spaces with more hidden loaded guns in more hands makes our communities less safe. A good guy with a gun rarely saves the day. More often, the gun that is intended to protect one from danger ends up doing just the opposite. Contrary to the notion that flooding our communities with guns will somehow reduce gun violence, a considerable body of study of research shows that states that have enacted permitless carry legislation are experiencing significant increases in gun violence. States that have weakened law enforcement authority to deny permits to people who might pose a danger to the public have seen an 11% increase in homicide rates and a 13 to 15% increase in violent crime rates. In 2003, Alaska became the first state to enact permitless carry legislation. Since then, the state has seen the rate of aggravated assaults with a gun increase by 65%. In Arizona, where the legislature enacted permitless carry in 2010, the rate of aggravated assault with a gun has increased by 8% translating to 921 more gun-related aggravated assaults per year. Here in Texas, we have experienced numerous horrific gun-related tragedies. Most recently, there was a shooting in the Midland Odessa communities in which a gunman drove through those two towns shooting innocent victims. In our committee, we heard testimony about one of the victims, a man in his early 20s, who was shopping for a car with his family. They watched as he was gunned down by a man who had previously failed a background check, but was later able to obtain a gun. Prior to that, a gunman drove across the state from Allen to El Paso to shoot innocent victims at a Walmart store. Immediately following the El Paso shooting, the governor held a roundtable discussion bringing together stakeholders to discuss safety measures. And yet, here we are in Texas, this legislative session, not passing laws to make us safer, but instead passing a law that will allow people to carry guns without any safety training or permit. 
Like all of you, I am responsible for protecting my constituents and ensuring the safety of my community, which is what brings me here today. House Bill 1927 poses a significant threat to the lives of well-being and well-being of Texans. If enacted, we can expect more gun violence, not less. As a legislator, I see our role as saving lives and preventing deaths. I hope today's hearing puts us all one step closer to fulfilling that goal. Thank you. General Lady's testimony was powerful. I'm gonna ask uh, our members to indulge us and I wanna ask the members as I recess, let me just thank our members, Karen Bass, Val Demings, Lucy McBath, Madeline Dean, Mary Gay Scanlon, Corey Bush, David, Cicilline, Ted Lou, Lou Carroyo, uh, Veronica Escobar, and Steve Cohen, who I hope will return. Uh, and uh, we will recess for the votes. Uh, to the uh, panelists, uh, if you could reserve, and uh, we will call to order in just a few minutes. This uh, is in recess. The committee is in recess.
Sky, we're actually across the stadium, so it's just been a bright sunny day. We weren't in a dark alley where we weren't supposed to be. Promises. And I finally realized it wasn't feeling. I thought, I got it. And I reached for my maybe 12 feet away. Well known for the smallest and sometimes a felony offense to carry a gun in your hand. I can tell you that I'm not mad at the guy that did this. A few things.
necessary in my purse for self-defense, and I was taught how to use it. A couple of years ago, my parents and I went to a cafeteria in Texas on a bright sunny day. We weren't in a dark alley where we weren't supposed to be. You well know.
first for self-defense, and I was taught how to use it. A couple of years ago, my parents and I went to a cafeteria in Texas.
My Do friend, you are you okay? Yes, I just I think we probably need to see the results real quick. Sorry. We'll call this hearing to order again. And uh, it is a entitled An Unending Crisis, Essential Steps to Reducing Gun Violence and Mass Shootings. As I begin to call on the other witnesses, I just want to take note of the fact of the introductions uh, that many of these witnesses have experienced their own personal stories of gun violence. And uh, I want to say to them uh, that they have our concern uh, and our hearts um, focused on their loss. Uh, the next uh, witness uh, knows that loss all too personally, and I indicated earlier as I introduced him uh, that uh, he has taken that to serve America. Scuttenberg, you are yielded to at this time for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Chairwoman Jackson Lee, Ranking Member Biggs, and distinguished members of the committee, Thank you for inviting me to testify today. My name is Fred Guttenberg. I am a father of two amazing children, Jesse and Jamie. On February 14, 2018, my daughter Jamie was murdered alongside 13 other children and three adults at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. My son Jesse, now 20, lives with the permanent scars of having heard his sister get shot. I am a father who lives with the sound of that single shot severing my daughter's spinal cord. I am a father who hopes his daughter died instantly. Otherwise, it means she suffered. My daughter will be 14 forever. My wife and I watch as all of the other kids post pictures of going to prom and college acceptances this year. We are happy for them, but we break down and cry because Jamie should be with them. I have been told, even by some here this morning, that I hate the Second Amendment and that I am a gun grabber. Nothing could be further from the truth. I simply want to save lives. My daughter was killed in a mass shooting, the kind we have seen over and over again in elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, colleges, concerts, movie theaters, grocery stores, bars, businesses, the list goes on, where a shooter is armed with an assault weapon and a large capacity magazine. These are weapons of war designed to kill as many people as possible, as fast as possible, and that's why they've become the weapon of choice for mass murderers. Congress must take action to ban assault weapons and large capacity magazines, which have killed thousands of innocent Americans. Mass shootings, like the one where my daughter was murdered, get a lot of attention, but they account for just a small percentage of American gun violence. 40,000 people die every year. That's over 100 day, a day in incidents of domestic and community violence, hate crimes, suicide, and unintentional shootings all across the country. In fact, in the time that it takes me to read this statement, somebody is getting shot right now. My friends, Kristen and Mike Song, know all too well the tragic consequences of what happens when a firearm is not safely stored. In 2018, their son Ethan, just 15, was unintentionally shot and killed after accessing an unsecured gun in a neighbor's house. This is not an anomaly in America. Every day, eight children and teens are unintentionally shot by unsecured loaded firearms found in a home. It's estimated that 4.6 million children live in homes with at least one unsecured gun. No one should know the pain of losing a child to a gun. We can and we must do better. I've been partnering with Brady, one of the nation's oldest gun violence prevention organizations, and they have led the End Family Fire Program, a national education campaign by gun owners, for gun owners, on the importance of safe storage. Family Fire is a shooting involving an improperly stored or misused gun found in the home, and it's one of the biggest contributors to gun deaths every year. Safe firearm storage provides a life-saving barrier between children or those in crisis from accessing guns, significantly decreasing the risk of family fire. Congress does have policy options for increasing safe storage. 
something which the vast majority of responsible gun owners already agree is important. Researchers have found that even a modest intervention that motivates gun owners to safely store guns could reduce youth firearm deaths by a third. For instance, Congress could pass legislation creating tax incentives to promote safe storage, like the Prevent Family Fire Act, which had broad bipartisan support last year. Congress can also take steps to educate the public more broadly about the benefits and the best practices of safe storage and could even require gun dealers to post that information when they sell guns. Ethan's Law, named in honor of Ethan's song, would create a legal obligation to safely store a firearm if a minor might have access to it. Had this common sense law been in place in 2018, Ethan's life could have been spared. I am grateful for my dear friends Kristen and Mike, but I truly wish I never knew them. These policies would have a measurable impact on people's lives, but there is more that Congress can do to protect public safety. This body has now twice passed legislation to expand and strengthen background checks for gun sales. Also, and very near to my heart, Congress should expand background checks to cover ammunition sales. Jamie's law, named in honor of my daughter, would do just that. It's not acceptable that so many lives are lost to gun violence in this country, and it doesn't have to be this way. I urge you all to take action to save lives. I am grateful for the opportunity to testify today before you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Gunn Herrick, thank you so very much for being willing to be here today. Thank you. Our sympathies again to you and your friends. And now I'm happy to yield five minutes to Ms. Muller. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Jackson Lee, Ranking Member Biggs, and committee members. I'm honored to be here today to discuss this important topic and brainstorm on strategies to save lives. For decades now, the conversation seems to only lead to gun control advocates pushing for more laws and more restrictions. It's time to look at the evidence, acknowledge the truth, and consider alternatives. The truth is we all want the same thing. We all want to be safe and we want our families to be safe. The difference is how we believe that is achieved. For over 30 years, the strictest gun control policies have been adopted by several major cities across the country. Based on decades of evidence in cities like St. Louis and Chicago and many more, it's apparent that these policies do not work. The results are the same. When average citizens are less capable of defending themselves, criminals are emboldened, crime soars, and communities are less safe. As a retired police officer, I saw firsthand the impact of violence on communities. I can tell you that buzzwords like epidemic, ghost guns, weapons of war, or assault weapon are designed to push false narratives and are designed to scare the public. We always hear about common sense gun control. Common sense is that cities plagued with violence should adopt the laws of cities that are not plagued with violence. Common sense is not making more rules, more laws, registrations, and fees that make protecting yourself a rich man's game. Gun control laws disproportionately affect lower income minority communities. Gun control is steeped in racism. Common sense is making mental health a priority when 55% of deaths are suicide. Common sense is holding criminals accountable for breaking the law instead of releasing them from jail, raising bail for them, or encouraging them to be more confrontational. Many Americans are exhausted by the incessant attacks on our Second Amendment rights. I founded the DC Project Women for Gun Rights because we were tired of listening to women who do not represent us women who are not experts in firearms or in violence, and yet they demand that legislators restrict our constitutional and civil rights. I'm honored to speak on behalf of the members of the DC's project, mothers, daughters, young and old, black, white, Latina, Asian, hunters, competitors, transgender, straight, hashtag me too, hashtag not me, on the political left and right. The Second Amendment wins on the intersectionality scale. There are women in our group that have endured unspeakable violence. Lucretia lost her son to gang violence. Melissa was stabbed 17 times, raped, beat, and left for dead in her parents' home. 
in a uh, stranger invasion. Nikki saw her husband shot and killed by her stalker in a gun-free zone, which is where 95% of mass killings occur. All of these women are intimately familiar with the failures of gun control. 2020 brought us a pandemic, riots, looting and killing, and an effort to defund the police. Crime is soaring in those cities. Americans are realizing that they are their own first responder, which is why we're seeing record gun sales and an estimated 8.4 million first-time purchasers. I will also add that the Second Amendment wasn't written about hunting. It was written about we, the people, and a tyrannical government. The question before us is how do we reduce violence in our country? There are details and links in my written testimony, but these are a few programs that have had successful results. The Hunter's Education Program has exponentially lowered firearms-related incidents and fatalities. The Kids Safe Foundation takes the target audience a step further and focuses on all children, not just hunters. Zero firearms accidents is the only acceptable goal. Hold My Guns is a suicide prevention program that respects civil rights. All of these are community-based, grassroots programs that are geared towards safety. Instead of exploiting tragedy and pushing pain to push agenda, a, con a gun control agenda, let's work in a nonpartisan way to expand programs and deliver measurable results. The DC Project women are available to resource to all of you. We will meet, talk, train, whatever we can do to achieve safety in our communities through education, not legislation. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and I look forward to your questions. Mulla for her testimony and I'm delighted to yield five minutes to Mr. Skaggs. Excuse me, Mr. Skaggs, it's Pastor Grady. I had checked him off, but he's not checked off. Pastor Grady, are you there? Yes, I am. Madam. You're unmuted, thank you. I'm yielding to you at this time, thank you. Thank you again, Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee uh, for <laughs> the opportunity to share my story uh, with you on today. Uh, my name is Michael Grady, and over the course of my life, I've, I've been blessed to hold several titles. I am the pastor of the Prince of Peace Christian Fellowship Church in El Paso, Texas, and uh, over two decades, I served in the chaplaincy of the United States Army. Uh, for the past 40 years plus, I've been married to my wife, Janelle, and we have three wonderful daughters. I'm here today, though, because of what happened on August the 3rd, 2019. On that morning, I was at home while my wife and daughter were at a shopping center uh, just a few minutes away from our home. At 10.45 a.m., time seemingly came to a halt when I received a panic call from my wife telling me to come to Walmart because my daughter, Michelle, our middle daughter, had been shot three times. Shot three times, my daughter. It was as if my wife was speaking a, a foreign language because the words did not immediately register. How could Michelle have been shot? Serving over 20 years in the army only to find my daughter to be shot in our own community seemed to me incomprehensible. But I snapped out of disbelief and immediately jumped in the car with my daughter, Jackie. When we arrived, our neighborhood shopping center looked more like a war zone you'd see on the evening news. We ran past people who appeared to have already lost their lives, desperately searching for Michelle while fearing the worst. Finally, we came upon my wife and Michelle, who was shot three times and in critical condition. She was rushed to the hospital. Thank God she survived. My daughter is as strong and resilient as anyone, but she still walked with a cane. And every day she deals with the trauma of that experience. Unfortunately, though, 23 other people did not make it. When I think about that day and the aftermath, I think about choices initially. I thought about the shooter's choices, his choice to buy a gun, his choice to get in a car, his choice to murder people because of the color of their skin and their country of origin, 
and all the chances he had to turn around, but he chose not to. But now I think about the uplifting choices that others have made since that day. Through my work as the chairman of the local chapter of the Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice and my ministry, I've, I've, I've met countless people affected by gun violence, most incidents that never make the headlines. They've chosen to share their stories and relive their trauma in hopes that it will compel our elected officials to take action. What I endured, survived, and witnessed on August the 3rd, 2019 occurs too often in our nation. Just 13 hours after my daughter was shot, another mass shooting occurred in Dayton, Ohio. That same weekend in Chicago, 40 people were shot, three fatally in a series of shootings. Gun violence destroys families and communities every single day in this country. This violence though is not inevitable. Action can be taken to give communities relief from this epidemic of violence. Policymakers can take action to pass common sense measures to prevent these tragedies like universal background checks to keep guns out of the hands of people who should not have them, extreme risk laws to give family members and law enforcement officers the chance to prevent someone showing signs of dangerous behavior or su suicidal issues from possessing or purchasing firearms. Better regulation of assault weapons, large capacity weapons that are often used in mass shootings and legislation to make sure that people convicted of hate crimes cannot access firearms. Gun violence shouldn't be a common experience in our communities all over America. Passing gun safety laws like the ones I mentioned above will prevent families from losing loved ones or enduring the physical and psychological trauma of a gunshot injury. And now today, I think about the choices before this Congress. I hope that you will choose to pass common sense gun laws, make investments in communities that will save lives and reduce the chances that another family will go through what mine has. Thank you and I yield my time. Much for his powerful testimony. And now it is time to recognize Mr. Skaggs for five minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairwoman Jackson Lee, uh, Ranking Member Biggs, members of the committee for the opportunity to testify. I'm Adam Skaggs, Chief Counsel and Policy Director at Giffords Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence. In 2020, America suffered not only from COVID-19, but from a gun violence crisis that surged in all its forms. Only five months into this year, we've already had more than 100 mass shootings. We've seen significant spikes in gun homicides, especially in communities of color, increases in gun suicides, and escalating domestic violence. We cannot allow this violence to continue for the next generation. I commend the House for its passage of several important gun safety bills including H.R. 8, which closes glaring loopholes in the background check system, H.R. 1446, which provides more time for the FBI to complete background checks, and H.R. 1620, which closes loopholes that allow abusive dating partners and convicted stalkers to access firearms. But I'd also like to address additional reforms that would make a critical difference and are a crucial part of a public health approach that is focused on prevention, is proportional to the seriousness of the issue, and is firmly grounded in data and research. First, extreme risk protection orders or ERPOs. Often after mass shootings, we learn that law enforcement or family members saw serious warning signs before any violence occurred. When someone poses a threat to themselves or others, extreme risk laws provide a way to intervene. And if and only if a court finds credible evidence they pose a serious risk of harming themselves or others, a means to temporarily remove guns and prevent them from buying new guns. Studies prove that ERPO laws are effective at preventing suicides and have prevented mass shootings. While 19 states in the district have these laws, Congress should support other states' efforts to pass and implement them, and Congress should prioritize Congresswoman McBath's H.R. 2377 uh, to create an extreme risk process in the federal courts. Next, I want to address homemade, untraceable firearms, so-called ghost guns that leverage a misinterpretation of federal law to allow people who would fail a background check to easily access guns. Ghost guns include weapons made with 3D printers, 
and guns assembled from kits that include unfinished parts. They lack serial numbers and are therefore untraceable by law enforcement, making them the weapons of choice for criminal gun traffickers responsible for a growing share of crime guns. Fortunately, ATF has proposed a rule ensuring that the key parts of ghost guns, frames and receivers, are properly treated as firearms. And several bills introduced this year would also address ghost guns, including H.R. 3088, introduced by Congressman Cicilline, Congresswoman Dean's H.R. 1447, and Representative Deutsch's bill to prohibit the online distribution of code for 3D printed guns. Turning now to the threat posed by unsecured guns in, in homes, research has shown there's an increased risk of suicide, unintentional injury, and death for children uh, when guns are not stored safely. Simple practices to safely secure guns can mean the difference between life and death for kids, and with 4.6 million American children living in homes with loaded, unlocked guns, it's critical, critical that Congress take action. We are grateful to Chair, Chairwoman Jackson Lee and Congresswoman DeLauro for their leadership on this issue. Their guns, their bills, would encourage gun owners to act responsibly. We also need laws that will encourage the gun industry to do the same. The gun lobby convinced Congress to pass the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, or PLACA, gives manufacturers and sellers of guns unprecedented immunity from lawsuits. PLACA has slammed the courthouse doors shut for the thousands of gun violence victims whose deaths and injuries could have been prevented if the gun industry behaved in a more responsible manner. This Congress has the right, the chance to right this wrong and should repeal PLACA by passing legislation like H.R. 2814 from Congressman Schiff. Finally, while we should treat the gun industry the same way that we treat other industries, not all guns are created equal. Semi-automatic assault rifles offer a particularly lethal combination. Rifle ammunition capable of penetrating bulletproof vests and detachable magazines that can hold as many as 100 rounds. This lethality has made them the weapon of choice for mass shooters, and we're glad that Congressman Cicilline has reintroduced his bill, H.R. 1808, to restrict access to these devices. And while we often hear about mass shootings committed with assault rifles, the gun industry is now manufacturing AR-15 style handguns that fire the same rounds. They pose a serious risk to law enforcement because they fire rifle ammunition that can penetrate body armor, but they're small enough to conceal. They were used to perpetrate mass shootings in Boulder and Dayton, Ohio, and Congress must ensure these dangerous weapons are properly regulated. I thank Congresswoman Demings for introducing H.R. 2466, which would do so. Thank you again, Madam Chair, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much. Um, this has been a very important set of statements that I believe are reflective of the concern of Americans. With the witnesses finishing their testimony, I will now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions, and I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. First, I think it's important to note uh, that I've not been able to find uh, any member of Congress that has used the killing of a loved one, of their constituents, the witnesses, as a narrative to enact what some may perceive as gun laws adverse to a small percentage of Americans, since over 80 to 90 percent of Americans believe in gun safety. And I think the record should be clear on that. Uh, let me quickly go to Mr. Guttenberg uh, for uh, his take on where we are today. And I'm short on time, so I will quickly pose my two questions together. Um, you spoke of the few friends who suffered because of lack of gun storage. We know that in the Sandy Hook tragedy, though guns were stored, they were accessible. And tragically, babies lost their life. You can speak to that. Uh, and then as well, the idea of family fire combined together where children are harmed. Um, and I know that you are well aware of those of us who believe in banning the assault weapon, appreciate Mr. Cicilline, uh, and continue to push for that. Mr. Guttenberg. Well, thank you. 
And, you know, you just highlighted some examples. We do know exactly what happened. We know why those shootings happened. And where we are today is sitting in a hearing where there's a lot of people in this room who don't want to acknowledge the facts that we know about what happened. Listen, you can be a Second Amendment advocate and want to save lives, okay? Just so everyone in this room knows, my father-in-law owns guns. My son has been shooting with him. My best friend is a law enforcement officer who actually is the one who identified my daughter's dead body, okay? So when I listen to this room and I hear all of these examples of reasons why some people refuse to take any action to save lives, it's infuriating. Because while we're here, like I said in my opening statement, someone is getting shot, and we know the reasons why. And we know it's gonna happen again because we continue to not take action. And no, there is no, listen, nobody is talking about um, anything other than steps to predictably save lives, background checks, the end family fire program, safe storage, you know, look, in 2005, you all did pass a bill which required safe storage devices go out with handguns. And you know what? We should extend that. Mm -hmm. This isn't rocket science, saving lives. You know, I just want to let everyone know, my daughter had rights. My daughter had rights to grow up, to live, to maybe be a Second Amendment activist. My daughter had a right to go to school, to go to college, to get married, and to make me a grandparent. And that is never going to happen. And the more we sit around here having BS arguments, the more you're going to be hearing conversations like this. Let's do this. We should be working together to save lives. And honestly, I hope we do. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I can encourage Mr. Biggs to support the storage bill. But let me go, Representative Goodwin. Uh, we know that the bill uh, that I spoke of earlier passed the Senate and the House and the state of, uh, state of Texas, but we know that it is now in the hard work of those of you in the House, it is now in conference. But I thought it was important to bring national attention to this bill. Would you tell us uh, more about that Texas House Bill 1927 and the implications of that bill in the midst of your personal story, but more importantly, in what you did on that bill today? Thank you. Thank you, absolutely. So House Bill 1927 essentially will let people walk around on our Texas streets without getting training. And we've heard from law enforcement. They came out and held a press conference on the Capitol steps saying that they're not in favor of this law. They like people getting training if they're going to own and possess a gun. Um, one of the things that I did add to the bill, a lot of the argument from the other side was that people like the license to carry in Texas. They're still going to get a license to carry. While we hope that is the case, I'm skeptical. And so I added an amendment to the bill that will have our Department of Public Safety uh, keep a record and provide a report back to the legislature of how many people do get a license to carry after this bill goes into effect and get the training that they need so that they can safely carry their guns. Just my final point to you. Um, you believe the ultimate passage of a permitless bill can endanger more lives in Texas and the nation? Absolutely. I believe more guns on the street does not make us safer. I, I also am very concerned for our children and just their mental well-being. You know, we're in Texas expanding upon our guardian and marshal programs, which allows folks to carry guns in our schools. And we have these uh, active shooter drills that really affect the mental health of our students. And that's also a very big concern of mine. Thank you very much. My time has expired. To recognize for five, Mr. Shabbat. Mr. Shabbat, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Muller, um, Approximately $1.7 billion gonna... uh, has been cut from police departments uh, nationwide. This comes at a time when uh, violent crime is skyrocketing in major cities uh, all across the country. Um, last year, the U.S. saw uh, 20, in fact, over 20,000 murders, um, the largest number since 1995, and that was 4,000 more than the year prior to that. The city that I have the honor to represent, uh, city of Cincinnati, 
uh, we experienced the deadliest uh, year that we'd seen in, in its history. And you're a 22-year uh, police officer, is that where Retired. Years, retired police officer. Um, wh what's your reaction um, to the defunding police across the nation, and what impact is that having on these skyrocketing uh, rates? Well, I believe that you could see, uh, well, any American can see over the past year right. of um, the violence and the rioting uh, that it just doesn't make any sense to us. It doesn't make any sense to vilify and demonize and undermine the police department, which you're saying is going to uh, be our savior when we give up our firearms. And now we're now we're really understanding that we are our own first responders. We are responsible for our own safety. And that's why, I mean, as frustrating as it is for Mr. Gutenberg, I'm just as frustrated for the exact opposite reasons. It's just interesting to hear him say that because I feel the exact same way, that why are we not working together and why are we not looking at the truths and the evidence that these guns don't work? All of these places that these are 95% of Gun, um, these mass killings are in gun-free zones. It's a problem. It's not a gun problem. It's a gun-free zone problem. No. So I, it doesn't make any sense to the average American that we would uh, defund the police and push gun control at the same time. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to read a quote uh, to you from a United States senator on the Senate uh, floor uh, some years back. Um, During my 12 and a half years as a member of this body, I have never believed that additional gun control or federal registration of guns would reduce crime. I am convinced that a criminal who wants a firearm can get one through illegal, untraceable, and registered sources with or without gun control. Um, that was Senator Joe Biden, by the way, um, quite some time ago. Now, in all fairness, he's uh, changed his mind on a whole lot of things like protecting uh, innocent unborn lives, the most vulnerable above us, but uh, I digress. Um, the, the comments that he made back there, um, do they seem for the most part accurate and, and reasonable? I agree uh, that they are accurate and reasonable, and um, I included in my written testimony uh, Susanna Hupp, who was in a mass shooting, mass killing, because I'm a shooter. <laughs> I kind of get offended at the shooting part. Um, a mass killing, and she's preaching the same thing 30 years ago. She testified, I was watching, her. it's in my, um, my written testimony, those links to when she was testifying almost 30 years ago, and she's speaking the truth. She's saying that gun-free zones kill, that magazine restrictions are not effective, and that she was legislated out of the right to protect herself. She left her gun somewhere else so she wouldn't have it in a gun-free zone. She's saying the same thing. The truth is remaining, the truth remains the same. Um, but as you can see, Mr. Biden has changed his position, and I believe that's because he, it's not truthful. Thank you, and I've only got about a minute left, so I, one more thing I'd like to ask you. And you had, I think, a very impactful uh, a written statement, opening statement as well. Um, Challenge is getting it in five minutes, so there was a lot in your written statement that you didn't have time to do in your in your uh, oral statement. So let me ask you this. You had a quote in here. It says, uh, gun control laws sound good, but do nothing to prevent criminals uh, from committing crimes. Could you kind of expound upon that, what you meant by that? Right. Uh, I think that we need to hold criminals accountable. We have been so soft uh, and bending over backwards to let bad people out of jail. Uh, you've seen it over the past several years, but um, when, crime, when people commit crimes, they should be held accountable. Instead of continually making more laws that is only going to continue to make more criminals. You know, you're, you're legislating me into being a criminal every time you want to take away my bump stock or every time you want to take away my magazine restrictions. Why should... Um, the burden be on the law abiding? Why can't we hold people that um, make ghost guns? Why can't we? It's illegal to sell them. Why can't we hold them accountable already with the laws that are already in place? Thank you. My time's expired, Madam Chair. Go back.
Newman's time has expired. Uh, we now recognize uh, Congresswoman Bass. Oh, I'm sorry. Nadler, I'm not ignoring you. We now recognize Mr. Nadler. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Muller, your statement that the purpose of the Second Amendment is to uh, um, prevent government tyranny necessarily means that people who think government policies are tyrannical have the right to turn their troops, they, they, turn their guns on American troops. I find that appalling. Mr. Skaggs, please describe the impact that the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act has had on the ability of, gun, of victims of gun violence to hold the gun industry accountable, and should we repeal that law? Well, it's essentially taking that ability away from them. Uh, the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act provides near blanket immunity to the gun industry. Uh, it prevents the vast majority of victims of gun violence from suing irresponsible actors within the industry, whether it's manufacturers or sellers. And if you look at the way the civil justice system has been used, for instance, with automobiles and with tobacco, uh, civil lawsuits against those industries led to significant uh, increases in safety. So we should repeal the law. You should. And why are assault weapons and concealable short-barreled assault rifles and pistols often the weapons of choice for people intending to engage in a mass shooting? Well, these are weapons that are designed with the specific purpose of being able to fire many, uh, many rounds in a very short period of time and equipped with large capacity magazines like the one that was used in the Dayton shooting that held 100 rounds. Uh, they can kill a lot of people very quickly, and that's why mass shooters use them. And what can Congress do to ensure that every American has access to an extreme risk protection order so that they can intervene when someone they love is in crisis? Well, Congress can encourage states to adopt these laws. 19 states in the District of Columbia have done so, but obviously many more haven't. Congress should uh, provide incentives for states to do so and to assist with implementation. And in those states that won't uh, enact these policies on their own, Congresswoman McBath's bill would allow federal courts to be utilized as kind of a backstop to state action on the issue uh, and would allow Americans across the entire country to ensure they have access to an extreme risk protection order. Thank you. Mr. Guttenberg, I'm so sorry for your loss and your advocacy inspires me. What you have described seems like responsible gun ownership. Can we really legislate that? And, 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 and if so, how? Well, we can, and we do it by acknowledging, I think, as you keep saying, truth and, and dealing with facts. And, and, and I'll use Cincinnati as an example of where facts sometimes maybe get disturbed because I've testified in Ohio. My family lives in Cincinnati. Um, the congressman is no longer here. He knows my family. I was in Cincinnati two years ago looking at the spike in gun violence in Cincinnati. And the reality is it has an awful lot to do with what Ohio has been doing with their loosening of gun laws in the state. So yes, we, we legislate all the time. There's a reason why I wear a seatbelt, okay? This body can legislate. In 2005, you did on the issue of guns. You actually required gun shops to give out a, a, a locking mechanism with handguns, that can be extended. This body can legislate to save lives, and it is irresponsible if it doesn't happen. Thank you, Pastor Grady. What are the long-term impacts on our children and our country if, if Congress fails to effectively address gun violence? Uh, thank you for asking. I think the long-term uh, implication is that our communities feel less safe uh, uncertain about uh, being able to uh, navigate uh, in a way that uh, produces um, credibility uh, for law enforcement to do their job and also for citizens to feel that they have a, a, a vested interest. I believe in community-based uh, alignment with law enforcement and the community to establish uh, programs, community-based violence intervention programs, uh, they've proven to be a good track record to measure the effectiveness of, of really coming together and, and talking about the real issue, and it is affecting the mental, psychological, and social uh, implications that come from the kind of violence that we've seen here in El Paso, Texas. We're still reeling from that, but we're trying to bring our community together, again, through police accountability, through the large, larger problem of communicating the effectiveness of this program that have been proven in several cities across the nation. 
Thank you. How as a faith leader have you had to address everyday violence in your community, and, and what solutions do you see would empower communities to respond to gun violence? Uh, thank you. One of the things that we've attempted to, to do here in the city through the interfaith community is to bring, again, uh, the community of faith together with uh, law enforcement and citizens and to disseminate information in a way that gives uh, our citizens a feeling of safety and a feeling that their needs will be addressed as it pertains to how they uh, navigate throughout the city of El Paso. The challenge is, again, getting law enforcement to, to, to really take a common sense approach to community policing. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest, and there was a time and a season in my life when police actually walked the beat, and they had a greater relationship uh, with the citizens in the communities in which they serve. So I think that's part of the answer, moving for a, produ a productive way of, of community policing, of, of, of resourcing our city so that they will be able to have a ac ac access uh, to the kind of uh, 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 common sense uh, uh, mental and physical health uh, occupational uh, apparatuses that will help to, uh, to, uh, to alleviate some of the struggle that we have in our cities. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Gomert from Texas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Susanna Hupp can be more articulate on this Preserving issue. Preserving my right think. to object. Uh, may I ask the gentleman if he gave the majority a 48-hour Notice that he intended to play the video in accordance with our committee AV protocol. I understood that uh, my staff had, I don't know for certain. So no. if the general lady is saying she's going to prohibit that from. Absolutely uh, not. Um, okay. I just I just asked the question, and right. so you don't you don't think you did? If that is the case, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. things happen, and so I'm going to be uh, generous to my fellow Texan. Uh, Congressman Gomert, and uh, we'll allow you to, Thank you. in spite of uh, the protocols not being followed, we'll allow you uh, to go oh, ahead yes. and play it. And I re withdraw my objection, so I yield Thank to you. you. Thank you so very much. Point of parliamentary inquiry, Madam Chair. The gentleman's recognized for parliamentary inquiry. I, I, my inquiry is your gracious accommodation of this, I hope, will not be read as a signal to violate the rules moving forward. Uh, uh, the the gentleman is recognized. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Uh, hopefully, they'll be able to play that. There it is. But I was given a gun by a friend when I was 21 to carry in my purse for self-defense, and I was taught how to use it. A couple of years ago, my parents and I went to a cafeteria in Texas on a bright, sunny day. We weren't in a dark alley where we weren't supposed to be. And as you all know the story, this madman drove his truck through the window, and he began shooting. Well, immediately, my father and I got down on the floor and put the table up in front of us. And this guy kept shooting, and you're thinking, what, you know, what could it be? Is it, is it a robbery? That's the first thing that generally comes to mind. And he keeps shooting. It took me a good 45 seconds to realize that this man wasn't there to commit a robbery. He wasn't there for a hit. He was there to simply shoot as many people as he possibly could. Now, I'd like to make something clear. I hear all this talk about how many bullets can go in a clip. I've been there. I can tell you it doesn't matter. It takes one second to switch out a clip. You can have one bullet or a hundred bullets. It doesn't matter, guys. I've been there. He goes, dump, dump, just like that. That's not enough time to rush a man. I promise you. When I finally realized what was occurring, I thought, I got him. And I reached for my purse. He was maybe 12 feet away. You know, is it possible my gun could have jammed? Sure. Is it possible I could have missed? Sure. But I can tell you I've hit much smaller targets at much greater distances. But then I realized that a couple of months earlier I had made the stupidest decision of my life. I took my gun out of my purse and left it in my car. Because as you well know, in the state of Texas, 
It's sometimes a felony offense to carry a gun in your purse. I can tell you that I'm not mad at the guy that did this. As he continued, it was obvious that he was a madman. My father at that point said, I'm gonna, I, I've got to do something, I've got to do something. He's going to kill everybody in here, and he rushed the man. No way. This guy turned, shot him in the chest. He went down, uh, was obviously mortally wounded. For whatever reason, that made the man change directions and go off to my left. Shortly thereafter, someone at the back of the restaurant broke out a window. When I saw what looked like an opportunity to escape, I turned around and I grabbed my mother by the shirt and I said, come on, come on, we've got to run, we've got to get out of here. And then my feet grew wings and I was out the back window. As soon as I got out, I realized that my mother had not followed me out. And as I learned from the police officers, she had crawled over to where my father was and cradled him until the guy got back around to her put the gun to her head, she looked up at him, put her head down, and he pulled the trigger. My parents had just had their 47th wedding anniversary. She wasn't going anywhere. As I mentioned, I'm not really mad at the guy that did this. And I'm certainly not mad at the guns that did this. They didn't walk in there by themselves and pull their own triggers. The guy that did it was a, a, a lunatic. That's like being mad at a, a rabid dog. I'm mad at my legislators for legislating me out of the right to protect myself and my family. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Huff has been uh, very helpful in getting good legislation passed in Texas. But uh, once again, there is nobody in here that I know of that is not just heartbroken over mass shootings. But once again, I find myself urging what I have for years. We ought to have hearings to get to the bottom of why people are taking guns and shooting. We've had guns throughout our history, modern weapons for the times throughout our history, but only in more recent history do we have so many mass shootings. And I would suggest the one place to start no matter how well-intentioned the war on poverty was, the federal government started paying people to get the father out of the home. And John Adams said this Constitution was intended for a moral and religious people. It isn't absolutely inadequate for any other. We need to get two-parent homes, and we need to get back to being a moral and religious people. My time's expired. I yield back. I thank the gentleman for his uh, questioning, and I now yield to the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Demings, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you for your leadership on this uh, issue. Thank you to all of our witnesses who are with us today, either virtually or in the room. Uh, let me be clear, um, is the prevalence of guns in the wrong hands, in the hands of criminals, in the hands of the mentally ill, and in the hands of terrorists. Guns in those hands is an American tragedy. And as someone who basically dedicated my life, certainly a large percentage of it as a law enforcement officer, to protecting and serving and saving lives, when we have the power to do that. This is not about taking guns out of the hands of law-abiding citizens. My father was a hunter. I grew up with a, it seems like a house full of guns. I carried one for a lot of years. But it's about keeping guns out of the wrong hands, not out of the hands of law-abiding citizens. Look, uh, Pulse Nightclub is in my district. Don't ask me not to care about the victims of that. Parkland is in my state. Don't ask me not to care about the victims in Parkland. This week, I'm joined by some of you in the room, including our distinguished chair, to introduce new legislation of Protecting Our Communities Act to close multiple loopholes in federal law that allows guns, those loopholes, that allow guns to fall into the wrong hands. Ghost guns, 
Are we really here today? Are there really some people in this room who are defending ghost guns, guns that are not traceable? What about armor-piercing, concealable, concealable assault weapons? These weapons can fire through ballistic vests worn by law enforcement officers and can be easily concealed. Are you asking me? as a former law enforcement officer, not to care about that. Milwaukee police officer Matthew Rittner was killed by one in 2019. Should we just forget that? The same year, a shooter in Dayton, Ohio, thank you, Mr. Skaggs, for mentioning that, killed nine people and injured 27 others. This year in Boulder, Colorado, a man with an AR-15-style pistol killed 10, including a responding officer. These weapons should be regulated under the National Firearms Act, but were specifically designed by gun companies to avoid those rules. We need to close loopholes in our background checks system, taking action to keep guns out of the wrong hands. I say that yet. Again, it's not controversial, the vast majority, because we do represent people throughout this nation, the vast majority of Americans agree that we should be taking straightforward steps to keep guns out of the wrong hands. Legislation can help us fulfill that mission. I still want, as a member of Congress, to protect and serve and save lives. And I'm asking my colleagues to join us in that effort. Mr. Skaggs, I really do have a question. You discussed in your testimony the proliferation and lethality of armor-piercing handguns, weapons that would be, or would be regulated under the National Firearms Act, both through the Law Enforcement Protection Act and the Protect Our Communities Act. Can you speak more in detail about why this, these particular weapons and the ammunition they fire are so dangerous to law enforcement and, quite frankly, to our children, our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends, and so many others. Absolutely. Thank you, Congresswoman Demings. Uh, you know, as you've pointed out, these weapons fire uh, rifle ammunition that can penetrate body armor that is worn by law enforcement for self-protection, uh, yet they're concealable, which makes them easier to transport. It makes them, frankly, easier to bring into spaces like a shopping market, like a, a grocery store in Boulder, Colorado, and, uh, and, and just commit the horror that occurred there. Uh, so these are designed by the industry to circumvent regulation under the National Firearms Act, which places stronger regulations on short-barreled rifles, and the industry has uh, attempted to evade that regulation by marketing these as assault-style pistols. Uh, they're dangerous to law enforcement, absolutely, but they're dangerous to American families and communities as well. Thank you so much, Mr. Skaggs. Madam Chair, I yield back. I thank the gentlelady for questioning, and I'm very happy to yield now to the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Biggs. I thank the- Five uh, minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we've heard uh, a lot, and uh, and we all want to get to the the root cause, I would assume, of what causes mass gun violence. But I, I think that we have to put some things in context. And one of those is we, we rarely hear about the use, the defensive use of guns, or the amount of lives guns save every single day. CDC estimated between 500,000 to 3 million per year are saved, lives are saved by the use, defensive use of firearms. And so, Ms. Muller, what do you think these numbers show us about how people are using firearms? Well, the statistics are that there's 40, I wanna say 46,000 uh, lives taken with guns. Um, some of that, uh, two thirds, I think it's 55% in 2020 was suicide. Uh, there are, it gets the number down to in the teens that we're talking about uh, people that would in your, 
in your districts that would uh, meet a gun in a gun crime, it considerably lowers that number. Now, if you look at the defensive use of firearms, it's exponentially higher than those numbers. So my position is that guns save lives exponentially more than they're taking unlawfully lives. So, Ms. Muller, with relationship to um, police coming in and responding to um, very dangerous situations, violent situations, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's, say, an active shooter, whether it's some other kind of violence that's being perpetrated, um, what's, how long does it usually take? I mean, what's, what's the difference vis-a-vis -vis their arrival time and their intervention time with those who are armed and can defend themselves and know how to use the weapon? Well, police response time is, I think there's an average of three to five minutes. Um, I can tell you that um, the majority of our time as police officers is spent cleaning up messes and responding and taking calls, um, taking reports and doing investigations. It is not protecting people. Um, it, it is actually, unfortunately, in my opinion, it, that it is not the police officer's duty by SCOTUS that they have no duty to protect, and that's what we found in Parkland. These- When you say, when you say SCOTUS, you're talking about the, a ruling of the United States Supreme Court. Yes, sir. Uh, we have to protect our children like we protect the people in this building. You guys use guns. You put a wall up. The hypocrisy doesn't go unnoticed. You put military people with guns everywhere. That's, if that's what it takes to protect our schools, that's what I expect Congress to do. It's not brain surgery. I want to protect the kids. So what, a comment was made earlier about uh, since Arizona went to a constitutional carry status in 2010, that the overall homicide rate per 100,000, she didn't, she didn't use the term one, per 100,000, but the overall homicide rate had increased in Arizona. Have you had a chance to look at those data? I did. Uh, it was during um, the legislator Goodwin's comments, the 8% of aggravated assault that had increased since Arizona adopted open carry or permitless carry. Um, that struck me because that's not consistent with what I know is statistics based on open carry. Um, and I went and looked at it while we, you guys were on recess. Um, in Arizona from 2010 to 2019, murder has declined 22%. Murder has declined 22%. Robberies has declined 19%. And aggravated assault, I'm still trying to figure out because she said aggravated assault with a firearm. And aggravated assault, it, it's not necessarily with just a firearm. There isn't a statute, at least in my old department or my old city and state, that assault, aggravated assault was with anything. It could be a car. So that was up 8%. So if you're going to, if, if she's just, going to claim just, that just, open just, carry. Just real quick, because I'm almost out of time. That data is not disaggregated in Arizona by whether it's by weapon or by, or by guns or by some other weapon, knife, car, anything, whether it's a police officer who's being assaulted because that categori is categorized as an aggravated assault. That information is not disaggregated. So that's why I found that testimony interesting. With that, my time has expired. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank the gentleman for his line of questioning. Uh, and as I indicated, there are many on this committee personally having experienced a life experience with guns and witnesses as well, none of whom I choose to believe are using that for a narrative to create gun laws. But I'm happy now to yield to one of our passionate and knowledgeable members, and that is the gentlelady from Georgia, Ms. McBath, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I thank each of you for your presence here today um, and giving your testimony. And let's be real. We're talking about gun violence prevention, not gun control. Nearly 10 years ago, you know, I lost my son to gun violence. Not a day that goes by that I don't think about him and wonder what kind of man he would be today if he were still here. And I came to Congress to prevent other families from experiencing the same pain of losing someone that you love so dearly 
to unnecessary gun violence. And I truly believe that without gun safety legislation, America becomes more powerful and violent in a more cruel and arbitrary way. Mr. Gutenberg, I know your pain too well. The reality is that for every day that we fail to pass common sense, and it is common sense gun safety legislation and reforms, more parents and more children, siblings, and partners will know the pain which no one in this room should ever, ever have to face. Just in Georgia, the state that I represent, we've lost Ahmaud Aubrey last year, unnecessarily and eight more in the recent tragic shootings with the Asian American community just this past March. And sadly, there are countless acts of violence that never make the headlines. No one ever talks about those individuals that we lose other than their loved ones in their communities. Nonetheless, the pain of those families is no less deep. So I am glad that we are here again today to keep doing this very critical and vital work Mr. Skaggs, I applaud Gifford's Law Center for the study of the effectiveness of extremist protection orders. 19 states, as you said, and also DC, have embraced this life-saving tool, and it's critical that we know whether or not these laws would be effective. Thanks to the studies like yours, we know that extremist protection orders, or red flags as we call them, really do save lives. And I am proud to have recently reintroduced the Federal Extreme Risk Protection Order Act. And, you know, that's going to make sure that every American can access this tool to help keep our communities safer. I'd like to ask you, how do ERPOs protect the due process rights of responsible gun owners? Well, I think it's, it's useful to note that these extreme risk protection order laws are modeled closely after uh, domestic violence restraining orders, or domestic violence protective order laws. Uh, they use similar procedures, similar standards, and those laws have been around in all the states, all 50 states, for decades. They've been used uh, repeatedly in, in serious situations, and they've repeatedly been found to comply with due process requirements. So we have something that is fully consistent with due process, that's the foundation for these ERPO laws. Uh, they, too, are consistent with due process. And with all that we hear about due process, uh, I don't hear anyone pointing to any court that has ever found that any of these ERPO laws have problems with due process. And there's a reason that we haven't heard of that, because there isn't a problem. Thank you. And our colleague made mention earlier uh, that there might be misuse of the ERPOs. So if there are there any penalties for those that actually abuse the use of ERPOs? Yeah, the ERPO laws around the states all include protections so that if someone for frivolous reasons or harassing reasons uh, files one of these, that person then subjects themselves to penalties. Uh, it's akin to, to perjury, which under federal law, uh, it can carry a five-year prison sentence. Uh, under your bill, I believe there's a, a $1,000 fine if anyone uh, files uh, a, a, a frivolous or harassing uh, request for an ERPO, uh, and that's similar to the states that prevent the misuse of the system by ensuring accountability for anybody who tries to abuse the system. Thank you for that. And Mr. Gutenberg, and you know, I'm proud to be a co-lead of uh, Jamie's Law, which is named after your daughter, which you mentioned today, uh, who you lost when she was just 14. Our laws already prohibit certain people from obtaining both firearms and ammunition. The current law doesn't require background checks for ammunition. Uh, Jamie's law merely requires just that, a background check for ammunition purchases. Please explain to this body today how Jamie's law actually saves lives. I, and I thank you for asking that. You know, we just saw a video played here a short while ago. That was a really old video. I don't know what year it's from, but I bring it up because unlike back then, Today, we have about 400 million weapons on the streets of America. That's a fact. And unfortunately, if you're a prohibited buyer of a firearm, you're also by law prohibited from getting the ammunition. But there's no requirement for a background check on ammunition. So amongst that 400 million that are in the hands of people who may want to kill us, they can get their weapon, steal it, get it from somewhere where it was unlocked, um, or a variety of other ways and simply walk into the store and buy the bullets. 
Jamie's law shuts down that loophole. It ensures that people who are currently unable to buy firearms, who can't pass a background check, they can't just walk in and buy the ammunition to use the weapon. Jamie's law will save lives immediately if passed because it shuts down that loophole. It takes that ability of those who do intend harm, who are in possession of weapons that they shouldn't be in possession of, from getting the ammunition to carry out the crime. Thank you. Thank you. You both an amount of time. I thank the gentlelady for her questioning as well. I'm now delighted to yield to the gentleman, um, Mr. Massey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, there are a lot of falsehoods that I want to uh, uh, disprove here today in, in the short time that I have. The first of which is that Republicans don't care about life or victims. We care about victims. I care about the victims of gun control. My former employee, my former staff member, watched her husband killed in front of her because she followed the gun control laws and the, her assailant, her stalker, did not. She left her concealed carry weapon in her car because it was a gun-free zone. It's a sign that no criminal ever pays attention to. So let me start with some of the other falsehoods here. The Charleston loophole. Democrats say if there had just been a few more days to check Dylan Roof's background, Roof would have been stopped from buying a gun. Here's the problem with that assertion. You can't buy a gun if you have a felony or certain misdemeanor convictions, or if you're arrested but not yet convicted of a crime, of a possible prison sentence of at least one year. But Roof's arrest was for a misdemeanor drug offense, which had a, mo a maximum possible sentence of six months. A longer waiting period, which the Democrats have asked for and said would s solve a lot of problems, would not have blocked his gun purchase. If Democrats want a waiting period, then pass a waiting period. Don't use a tragedy as an example that doesn't apply. If they want to, if they want to ban misdemeanor uh, offenses, people who've committed them from possessing a gun, then do that. But don't call it the Charleston loophole. It's not a loophole. Fact check me on this. Now, let's talk about safe storage laws. I asked unanimous consent to enter an article into the record from the Journal of Law and Economics. I'll read a little bit of the abstract. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's frequently assumed that safe storage gun laws reduce accidental gun deaths and total suicides, while the possible impact on crime rates are ignored. But the abstract says, we find no support that safe storage laws either reduce juvenile accidental gun deaths or suicides. Instead, these storage requirements appear to impair people's ability to use guns defensively. It's just common sense. If you, somebody breaks into your house and your gun's locked up, how are you going to use it to defend yourself? We don't want to see a victim of gun control, and this would cause more victims of gun control. Now let's talk about background checks. <laughs> well, first of all, I've heard it said that 90% of Americans support background checks. Well, the last two states that put us at a, as a referendum, uh, Maine and Nevada, on their ballot, there weren't 90%. It went down by 4% in Maine. It lost, the initiative lost, to have uh, universal background checks. In Nevada, Bloomberg spent $35 per vote, and it barely won by 0.8% of, of, uh, uh, in that ballot initiative. So it's clearly 80% or 90% don't support background checks. Let me tell you why they don't support background checks. There were 112,000 denials due to federal background checks in 2017. How many, how many prosecutions do you think there were? By the way, these would be easy prosecutions. Somebody has lied uh, they, they, on, a, on a form and they, a prohibited person, a felon, has signed a form stating they are not prohibited. Perjury is not difficult to prove when you provide a photo ID. But how many were convicted of the 112,000 denials? 12. 12 federal prosecutions. So over time, the false positives have added up to several million people. The mistakes overwhelmingly affect minority males. People tend to have similar names in their racial and ethnic groups. Hispanics have names similar to other Hispanics. Blacks have names similar to other blacks. Dr. John Lott says that when he was recently working in the U.S. Department of Justice, he saw data showing that the false positive rate for black males was more than three times their share of the population. It was more than twice the share of the population for Hispanic males. These are victims of gun control. 
victims of gun control. Now, there are some places where they say, well, if you have a good reason, we'll let you have a gun. These are the mo this is where you see the most racial discrimination. In Los Angeles County, where about 50% of the population is, is Hispanic, they only get about 6.5% of the gun permits. Women about 7% and blacks 5%. But nationwide, where people can get a permit, generally without having to demonstrate such a need, 30% of permit holders are women. 13% are black. It's, if you're well-connected, if your last name is Biden, you can lie on a form, you can get a gun. If you need special permission in New York City, you can get a gun if you're, if you're wealthy and famous. But if you're a poor minority, no. And here's, here's another problem with the gun control that's gonna cause more victims of gun control. Who are least able to take 16 hours of their lives and commit it to training and pay $500 for that training? in order to exercise a basic right. Liberals say, well, if you have photo IDs and costs and trainings associated with voting, you're disenfranchising the poor and the minorities. Well, what does this do when you, when you require all of those things to exercise a basic fundamental human right? It's not just a constitutional right, it's a God-given right. It's just restated there in the Constitution. So I would, I would say, and I, there's even more uh, things that I could disprove here today with facts, but Republicans care about lives. We care about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You cannot have liberty. You cannot have the pursuit of happiness without defense of life, and that's what we stand for, and I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Now happy to call on the lady from Pennsylvania, Congresswoman Dean, for five minutes. I thank the chairwoman uh, for this powerful uh, hearing and the important testimony from all of our witnesses. Uh, I, I want to start with what touched me from the pastor. Uh, pastors told us it's all about choices, uh, and that couldn't be more true today. I'm puzzled by the choice that the ranking member began with. On the importance of this topic, he began with the notion that he was offended by the alleged inaccuracies of members when they mischaracterized or misnamed or misidentified a weapon. Others are uneasy, they're nervous that we might be involved in some sort of gun control. Would, would it be, and would that, the ranking member and others would be more nervous, would be more offended that eight children a day die from a failure of safe storage, that 20,000 people die of gun violence this year, the highest in 20 years, that 24,000 people die by suicide, by gun, that 600 people die in mass shootings, a 50% increase from 2019. Would that the members on the other side of the aisle would care and be offended by 316 people a day shot and wounded. I call it a jetliner a day. 106 will die in that jetliner as it tumbles to the earth, and the remaining ones will be wounded in the crossfire. It's a jetliner a day, 365 days a year. Would that the members on the other side of the aisle would care about those troubling numbers with that they cared about the slaughter. Mr. Gutenberg, I am heartbroken and privileged to walk with you in this work. For your testimony, firearm owners who keep their guns locked or unloaded are at least 60% less likely to die from firearm-related suicide, and adolescents in these households have significantly lower risk of firearm suicide or of being unintentionally shot. With different firearm storage mechanisms, from underneath a bedroom pillow or from inside Tupperware or above a bureau, uh, what should members of Congress know about really, truly safe storage devices for guns in the Prevent Family Fire Act? You know, listen, um, my friends Mike and Kristen Song, their son is dead because somebody kept a, a gun in a shoebox. That's not safe storage. There are all sorts of easily accessible locking devices that can be kept in a home, some with smart technology, and I think we ought to be really, really working harder on that. But safe storage does not remove anyone's right. 
It does not remove their access to a weapon. It does not make it hard for them to use their weapon. It may save lives. I brought um, some different things here. For example, this is the Betsy DeVos School Safety Report after Parkland. This is the Secret Service Report. And this is the Margaret Stillman Douglas Report. Every one of them talks about the fact that the majority of kids who use weapons in shootings get them from a home where they were improperly locked or stored. Those are simple facts that is truth. And so a requirement that we lock and safely store a device is not an infringement upon anybody's right. I heard everything that was said down there. I will simply say I reject almost all of it. Um, and my daughter would be alive today if somebody put the rights of all of us to be free from gun violence. We ought to be able to say we respect the rights of gun owners, but we also recognize we can be better, we can do better to save lives. I also just have to say something about Parkland since it came up, okay? Because my daughter died in Parkland, and so when people bring it up, it matters. You're right, law enforcement failed that day. There's no question about it. I am painfully aware of that. But to say that nobody would have died that day if law enforcement had shown up is simply inaccurate and wrong. And in fact, while my daughter would have, might have been saved, she was on the third floor, everyone on the first floor still would have been shot and killed most likely. If you are okay with that as an outcome, that's on you, but I'm not. We can be better than this, we're gonna be better than this, and I am counting on this body to get some of these laws passed, thank you. And I see my time is nearly expired. Do I have time for one quick question in terms of undetected? The lady is quick. Uh, uh, Mr. Skaggs, can you uh, provide any further information on the bill that I have introduced and others are supporting uh, the not Undetectable Firearms uh, Modernization Act? Well, look, you know, it's, it's been a bipartisan agreement for years that we shouldn't have guns that can be smuggled onto airplanes and other places where metal detectors are used. With new increases in technology that allow for guns to be manufactured with 3D, printed, uh, 3D printers uh, that are basically made of plastic and can't be detected by regular metal detectors, it's crucially important that we require uh, that guns, that, that we prohibit guns that can't be detected by security technology. And finally, I, I just want to say we all agree that we want to keep ourselves and our families uh, safe. We want one other thing, to end the slaughter. And I yield back. I thank the gentlelady for her very forceful questioning. Uh, the Republicans reserve, and so I will yield to the gentlelady from Pennsylvania as well, Congresswoman uh, Mary Gay Scanlon. Thank Five you. minutes. Thank you to all of our witnesses for your testimony here today including those who have suffered such excruciating loss. And thank you, Chairwoman Jackson Lee, for calling this important hearing about gun violence, which is unfortunately a horrifying reality in parts of my district. Uh, the spike in mass shootings that we're seeing across the country right now is appalling, but what doesn't make the headlines often enough is the steady toll of gun violence that plagues too many communities, including those in my district, day in and day out. During the pandemic, shootings never stopped in neighborhoods throughout my district, including in Chester and Philadelphia. Two weekends ago, seven people were killed and 18 injured in gun violence in one weekend. The city has lost more than 150 lives in over 700 shootings so far this year, and a heartbreaking number of those victims were children, some as young as six years old. Yesterday in Southwest Philadelphia, there was a community rally at the Mitchell Elementary School to bring attention to the unrelenting gun violence in that neighborhood. There have been 46 shooting victims uh, within a few blocks area just this year. And that gun violence hasn't occurred because of a lack of training in gun safety. The gun violence in King Sessing and elsewhere has occurred because this body has not passed legislation to stop the flow of illegal guns and ghost guns into our communities to stop the sale of guns to people who we all agree should not have them and to stop the flow of weapons of war to civilians. And we haven't given our communities the tools they need to stop this violence. You know, the 
the families and, and students at Mitchell Elementary School, many of them have refused the invitation to return to in-person learning this spring because of the epidemic, but not the COVID epidemic because of the epidemic of gun violence in their community. The kids are afraid to go to school. Their parents are afraid to let them. So this isn't a Second Amendment issue. It's a public health crisis. And I know we all understand the response that a public health crisis demands, or at least many of us do. We need a comprehensive, multifaceted approach driven by research and data to address the many facets of the gun violence ep epidemic. Now, Mr. Skaggs, um, I have localities in my district currently working towards implementing the evidence-based strategy of group violence intervention. It was actually used in Philadelphia around 2012, 2013 with marked success, but like so many of these initiatives, it ran out of funding. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about what that strategy entails. Sure. Well, there are, are programs that have been proven time and again to be effective. Um, communities that are, are racked with higher levels of gun violence are, are often, the patterns of gun violence in those communities in, involve a, a, a tiny percentage of the population who are most likely both to, uh, to, to, to be shooters and also to be victims of gun violence. And Strategies that target those individuals, intervene with those individuals, provide support, uh, and make clear the consequences of continuing to engage in violent behavior have been shown time and again to produce the kind of results that you described. Oakland, California, to take just a single example, cut their uh, gun violence rate in half by 50%. The problem with these programs is they're often not adequately or consistently funded. They, they require sustained funding, uh, and, and that's uh, really the key to their success. And, and I do think it's important to address both the availability of guns um, and, and illegal guns and people who shouldn't have them in our <coughs> communities, but also the kind of community supports. There's a lot of data coming out recently about the correlation between poverty, hunger, and high gun violence, and that's certainly something we're seeing in, in my district. How can Congress best support local efforts to curb gun violence and create safer communities through violence intervention programs? Well, Congress can appropriate funding. Uh, Congress can study and uh, promote best practices and, and that sort of thing, but the, it's not a complex question, answer to that question. Congress can appropriate funding to be given to these uh, programs across the country. And we've seen some progress on that, and we're very pleased about that. But sustained, adequate funding is absolutely the key to success. So you'd agree that doing nothing is probably not the most successful option? That has uh, generally been proven by experience not to work in my uh, knowledge. Thank you. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. I thank her for her questioning, and I'm pleased to re, uh, yield to the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Mr. You, Jordan. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Uh, Ms. Muller, uh, is it a good idea to defund the police? No, sir. You spent time as a law enforcement officer, isn't that right? That's yes, your sir. Background? Retired law enforcement officer. How many years? 20-some 20, 20 years? 22. I think? 22 years. Who'd you, who'd you end up retiring? What, 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 what uh, police department? Uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oh, so not some small town. Is This is not, 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 not any, you know, small town officers are just as important as, as large cities, but this is in a big city. Correct. And uh, you dealt with all kinds of things. You dealt with gang violence. I think you said you were on the gang violence task force and w did work with that? I did. Yes, yeah, so you've dealt with some, uh, some, some tough situations. What do you think of these uh, extreme protection orders? Well, I think that uh, the Supreme Court of the United States just had something to say about it. Um, they just had a ruling at the end of last week. I don't even know what today it is, so forgive me. But recently that um, they struck it down, I believe in Maryland or uh, somewhere. Uh, so I don't think that that's going to be an issue because uh, it, here, here's my background on extreme protection orders. Um, we already have a vehicle to help people who are in crisis. We have a vehicle uh, to hold the 72 hours and get a psychological evaluation. A red flag law, like going and taking somebody's guns, removing one means of having an issue, where is the compassion in helping somebody by removing their means to defend themselves if they should need it during that time that they're in crisis? Especially, Ms. Muller, if I could, especially when the uh, process for removing that, the, the person who's gonna be losing their 
firearm, losing their Second Amendment liberties, doesn't even get to be a part of that initial hearing. Correct. And um, Mr. Massey brought up uh, Nikki, who, you know, she went through a traumatic incident. She saw her husband murdered. Uh, this extreme protection orders could affect her because if somebody says, hey, Nikki's not having a great day, I think that you probably need to go pick up her guns. When this guy that killed her, the stalker that killed her husband, is still stalking her from prison, how would that make, I mean, there's just so many unintended consequences when it comes to red flag orders, let alone the what constitutionality. Ab or what about this scenario? What about a family of, of someone that you arrested and, um, and went, went away to prison and the family doesn't like you? And they go say, well, this, this Mueller lady, you know, she's, she believes in the Second Amendment. I, I think I saw a Trump flag in her yard. I don't like her. And they, they, they file this thing and you get the right kind of hearing where you don't get to go defend yourself at that hearing and they come take your firearm. Those are the kind of scenarios that scare me. We know in this cancel culture world that we live in, those, those kind of things happen all the time. Or how about this scenario? How about you have to go enforce an EPO? So you're the officer. Go back 10 years, 12 years ago, whenever you in, were is a, a member of the Tulsa Police Department, and you've dealt with all kinds, you gotta go now enforce it, and you gotta, you gotta go knock on the door and tell Mr. Jones or Mrs. Smith, hey, they just took your gun away, I'm here to take it. There was a, there was a proceeding, now you weren't a part of it, just your Second Amendment liberties. You weren't a part of it, but I got to take your gun. That may not be the best situation either for a cop to be walking into, would it? And your Fourth Amendment. Yeah, of course. We're going to trample on your Second and your Fourth. Uh, it's very dangerous for police officers, um, extreme protection. But, you know, I was struck by us saying that we, we want to do nothing. I, I gave, like, 12 pages of testimony of things that I want to do. Exactly. And everybody's talking about laws and things that I have ideas. And that's what I'm saying is a big injustice is that you're not listening to me. It's you, the, the, the anti-gun people are so closed off to anything but their own agenda that they can't hear that we have measurable results uh, in firearms education and yep. that we should be t teaching our kids uh, how to properly and safely be around firearms. It's just like water safety. Well, Ms. Miller, if I, 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 ahead, I you're doing great, but I <laughs> promised my colleague and friend, Mr. Massey, I'd yield him some time and I'm down to 40. So Mr. Massey, you got my time. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. 94% uh, of all successful mass public shootings in the United States since 1950 have occurred in places where the average citizen was banned from possessing guns. These attackers are evil. They might be crazy, but they aren't stupid. They look for vulnerable victims. And I mean, this gets back to my prior point that Republicans want to save lives. One of the things that we've noticed in the data is school shootings have gone up in the last decade, but the entirety of that increase in percentage has occurred in schools that do not allow teachers to carry firearms. There are 20 states in this union that allow, in some form or another, teachers to carry firearms. They haven't had, with the exception of, a, of gang violence outside of school hours or suicide, they've not had a single shooting, not a single homicide in one of these uh, schools that allows teachers to carry. So this is another area where I think if we would pass my Safe Students Act, which would remove the ambiguity on the federal law that, by the way, there's a federal law that bans anybody from bringing a gun into the school. That hasn't worked, but what it has done is made students less safe. So I would like to see us pass the Safe Students Act. And with that, I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. We've been generous uh, with uh, the time uh, for uh, members who are interested in this topic. And I'm delighted now to yield to the gentleman from Rhode Island. Thank him for his leadership, Mr. Cicilline, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you for holding this really important hearing. Um, the gun violence epidemic in this country that we face is like nowhere else in the world. In a recent national poll, 58% of American adults reported that they or someone they care for has experienced gun violence in their lifetime. Americans are 25 times more likely than people in other nations to experience gun violence. We lose 38,000 Americans every single year to senseless gun violence, including 23,000 Americans that die by suicide every year with a gun. There were almost 200 mass shootings in 2021 alone. We have a gun violence epidemic in this country. And the answers that we always hear from the opponents of common sense gun safety legislation are twofold. One is, we can't pass a law that will stop every bit of gun violence in the country, so we should do nothing. 
or criminals are going to commit crimes anyway. Both of those things are true. But that doesn't mean we don't have a responsibility to pass laws that will substantially reduce gun violence in this country. And we know how to do it. We've researched it for years. And I want to say to Mr. Guttenberg, to the pastor, thank you for being such incredible advocates. Every time you're asked to talk about this, I know you relive this unbearably painful experience. You are, for me, a tremendous inspiration, and I thank you for being here. Mr. Skaggs, thank you for the great work that you do and your organization does. And while I don't have a question for Ms. Muller, one of the reasons that maybe people aren't listening to you, because when arguments are made that a deranged, seriously mentally ill person should get to keep a firearm which endangers the community, and the off chance that that dangerously mentally ill person will need the firearm to defend himself is lunacy. And that's why I think we find it difficult to listen to some of the things you've suggested today. We know what we need to do. Universal background checks, closing the Charleston loophole, the assault weapons ban, red flag laws, ban the sale of ghost guns, uh, make sure that people buy ammunition, go through a background check. These things will save lives. And so the first thing I have is for you, Mr. Skaggs. Can you explain what the danger is with respect to the background check system with ghost guns, because there's evidence that gangs and drug dealers and criminal elements are assembling and getting guns, uh, ghost guns, and how does that relate to the background check system? Well, the reason ghost guns are so dangerous is because all the people you described are able to acquire these guns without a background check. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, if you need to drill a couple of holes in an unfinished product to assemble your own gun at home, the gun functions just like an AR-15 that you bought fully assembled. The gun functions just like a Glock pistol that you bought fully assembled, uh, but under a misinterpretation of federal law, uh, these products, because they're not 100% finished, are sold without background checks. There's no serial number, no record keeping, and that's why criminals are using them. That's why they're attractive to illegal uh, gun traffickers. Thank you. Uh, Representative Goodwin, thank you for your uh, good work. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about this city or this state has great gun laws, but it hasn't solved all the problems. Would you speak a little bit of why state regulation uh, or local regulation of firearms isn't enough to prevent gun violence and what role you believe the federal government must play for effective strategies to reduce gun violence in this country? Absolutely. I mean, we can cross state lines very easily. So one state having one law that's different from the next door neighbor isn't effective enough. We have such a patchwork quilt of, of regulations on our guns. So we need a, a universal background check that's uh, throughout the United States. So someone can't go into Oklahoma and come into Texas with a gun or vice versa. Um, it, it's, it's critical that we do the things that you mentioned, the universal background checks. I was just speaking with a um, federal firearms licensee who uh, came across somebody who was selling these ghost guns. And he has, there's very little that he can do. I know it was brought up why don't some of these uh, people get punished? Well, a lot of your gun store owners don't ha have a responsibility to turn that information in and they don't wanna get involved in it. So um, we've gotta have better laws. Thank you. And I just wanna ask Mr. Guttenberg, my last 30 seconds. I know there was a, Ms. Muller said she was frustrated. I, I don't think by that she meant that you share the same frustration. You've lost a child. And you have come time and time again imploring the Congress of the United States to take action so that other children and other people across this country don't have their lives taken because of senseless gun violence. Do you have some final thoughts for this committee? Well, you know what? I'm going to go back to the ghost gun question and why this matters. Because another unfortunate friend of mine, Brian Mullenberger in California, whose daughter Gracie died in the Saugus school shooting of a ghost gun. Just so everyone here knows why what this work matters. After his daughter was killed, his daughter, his dead daughter, went online and purchased the components to then make a ghost gun. That's how easy it was, okay? So anyone who thinks we shouldn't be doing better than that, I mean, Brian documented the whole entire thing. And by the way, not only was she dead, she was, I think, 14 or 15 when she did it and was able to successfully achieve it. So your work matters. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Let's keep doing this. Thank you. And I yield back, Madam Chair. 
Gentleman uh, yields back. His time has expired, and I, I am pleased to yield five minutes to the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Escobar. Thank you, Madam Chair, and many thanks to our uh, panelists today. On August 3rd, 2019, El Paso was in the crosshairs. We were at the intersection of America's hate epidemic, fueled by anti-immigrant rhetoric, um, rhetoric that is used, unfortunately, by colleagues of mine, and also fueled by the gun violence epidemic. And yes, ma'am, it's an epidemic. It was the deadliest targeted attack on Latinos in modern American history, an attack that created an entire region of gun violence survivors. Not just the victims and the survivors, but the healthcare professionals, the social workers, the therapists, the law enforcement officers, the journalists, and so many, literally hundreds of thousands of others in our region, suffering now from secondary trauma that is ongoing. And this, uh, the ongoing consequences of this kind of attack doesn't just include physical or mental health consequences, long-lasting, enduring consequences, but financial consequences as well. Just as an example, El Paso local taxpayers are funding both the prosecution and the public, defend, the public defense leading up to and during the trial process of the domestic terrorist who committed this horrific attack. That process, which includes jailing the domestic terrorist, all the experts required for both his prosecution and his defense, this will cost taxpayers in my community, the same people who are gun violence survivors, they will now have to pay over a million dollars as a result. This is just on the judicial process alone. This doesn't include the therapy, this doesn't include the ongoing surgeries and physical therapy, everything associated with the consequences of that attack. Immediately after that, my governor, Greg Abbott, came into my community, spoke with some of the survivors, and he promised that there would be action. But what has been an example of a miserable failure of leadership he has moved in the other direction, and we've heard during this hearing about permitless carry that has been approved in the state legislature. It feels as though for leaders, Republican leaders in my state, there isn't enough bloodshed and misery across the board. Here in Congress, it is so incredibly frustrating to hear thoughts and prayers coming from my Republican colleagues to hear them begin hearings with, oh, my sympathies to the families, but, and there's always a but. And I don't know when we will finally get to the solutions, which are so clear cut, so easy, and so supported by a broad, a broad swath of American voters and, and communities all over the country. In fact, um, too frequently, my colleagues are eager to continue to, to fuel the, the flames of division instead of partnering with us on common sense solutions. Gun violence prevention laws work. From 1994 to 2004, there was a 25% decrease in gun massacres and a 40% decrease in fatalities associated with assault weapons. Why? Because the federal assault weapons ban was in effect. They work. The statistics show it. And the, I, I wish that we didn't have another party that was so detached from the truth, but we have one. And so this is why we can't seem to make progress. Pastor Grady, in the, as I mentioned, there are long-standing consequences and effects that survivors have to face can you share with us what you and Michelle have had to live with, Michelle and your wife have had to live with since the massacre in 2019? Well, thank you so much, Congresswoman. Yes, we've had to uh, deal with a myriad of issues of the, uh, from the uh, mass shooting, uh, the hospital visits, the surgeries, 
uh, the psychological, the emotional trauma, uh, trying to make sense out of uh, what actually happened here in the city of El Paso and why hatred seemed to be the call word of that particular day. Uh, we've had to struggle with, uh, uh, watch Michelle as she had to rehabilitate and she's still in a rehabilitative uh, state uh, and, and how it has impacted our community uh, because we, we adopted a slogan, uh, El Paso Strong, but our strength comes from the reality that our legislators have an awesome responsibility uh, to, to make the uh, common sense gun legislation, to look at mental health issues, uh, and to uh, provide resources, community-based violence intervention programs. So we've had to deal with a myriad of issues, uh, but I'm grateful to say that Michelle has, has risen to the challenge. My wife and I, we continue to, and our family, we continue to support her. And because of my work with uh, crime survivors for safety and justice, we hear from other uh, families in our city that have, are still reeling uh, from the, uh, the slaughter that happened in our city. Uh, but we are determined to continue to press for common sense gun legislation to make available resources for those who are still suffering to heal the brokenhearted and to reach out to the least, the lost, the left out and the disenfranchised. So we continue to be an advocate for uh, strong policies, uh, limiting access to guns and all of those issues. But our family continue to gain strength from the hope that this committee is doing now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Grady. You, Mr. Gutenberg, and so many other survivors deserve justice and action. Madam Chair, thank you. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Madam Chair, I have a unanimous consent request. Uh, gentleman is recognized. Uh, just to further support Congresswoman Escobar's uh, presentation, I'd ask unanimous consent that this graph, which was reprinted in the Washington Post entitled Gun Massacres Fell During the Assault Weapons Ban, which shows the gun massacres both before and after the ban and a considerable increase. I'd also ask unanimous consent to inject into the record uh, a, a fact check which determines that AR-50 style assault weapons were used in uh, 11 or 10 of the last 11 mass shootings in this country. Without objection, so ordered. Now recognize Congresswoman Bush for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Um, for convening this important hearing. Um, people in my district are no strangers to gun violence. This year alone, we have had 73 homicides just in the city of St. Louis with a population of less than 300,000 people. Countless incidents of domestic violence, child abuse, and other forms of traumatic community violence. For years, we've watched our neighborhoods, our schools, parks, and infrastructure be underfunded or actively defunded. My hometown has been devastated by a lack of access to trauma prevention and mental health services. At the same time, black and brown communities and my uh, um, people in our community are disproportionately impacted by mass incarceration, mass deportations and over policing. We must expand our understanding of gun violence as well as propose solutions to attack gun control as a social issue rather than carceral. Preventing gun violence means prioritizing the well-being of our communities by bolstering social programs and providing so resources and support for those who need it the most. Pastor Grady, I extend my sincere empathy to you and your family for the trauma you endured following the El Paso massacre. I thank you for being here to speak on behalf of the countless victims of gun violence who have endured a similar fate. In the interest of preventing gun violence before it happens, can you speak to the utility of community violence prevention programs? Yes, I believe uh, uh, the community-based uh, violence intervention programs really have, have a, a proven track record of being effective uh, and are vital in ensuring the safety of our communities. Uh, it's it's relationship-based, it's outreach strategies, it's working with uh, law enforcement as well as with the faith-based community and to educate and to provide resources, I mean, human resources, funding uh, that we might be able to uh, arrest uh, some of the ills that continue to perplex our communities. And again, one of the uh, keys of achieving a more just and peaceful America will be focusing on significant investment of strategy that reduce violence. 
that brings communities together to expose the darkness, to offer the light. Because it's not just one particular thing that causes uh, mass shootings. It is a community. It is a dis-ease. It is a not at ease in our communities based on resources. And then incarceration rates. Again, and what happens once a person is, uh, is released from uh, institutionalized uh, 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 places where they are supposed to be rehabilitated. And as you know, I'm from St. Louis. Many times when someone is uh, released from incarceration, they drop him off maybe a block from where they picked him up. Right. So back into that environment consistently. So I believe, again, uh, that if we could continue to uh, get funding for our community-based intervention programs. We can continue to work with the faith-based community and to invite our law enforcement uh, agency to be more community-based. We can begin to arrest this situation and circumstance. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Well, thank you. Thank yes. you, Pastor Grady. Um, Mr. Skagg, as policy director of the Giffords Law Center, can you speak to how these laws are applied in practice and specifically can you describe potential unintended consequences of these gun safety policies for black and brown communities who are often the ones that are disproportionately criminalized and charged and prosecuted for firearms? The unintended consequences. I think there, I think there are serious structural problems with our criminal justice system and mass incarceration in this country and all too often black and brown Americans uh, bear the brunt of those structural problems. And I think it's critically important that any of the policies that we're looking at, we look very carefully at enforcement to ensure even-handed, fair enforcement, and there's a very, very long way to go. Uh, but I think uh, the policies we're talking about today are important steps forward to addressing this ongoing crisis um, and I, I think um, we need to pass the bills that we've been talking about. Thank you. I firmly believe we have the power to transform our community with intentional and deliberate policies that encourage the overall health and the well being of those who have the least. Carceral solutions only serve to exacerbate these issues and increase the number of interactions between civilians and the police. It is time to fully fund and support community-led and develop solutions to address the root causes of trauma and of gun violence. We cannot police our way to public safety. Thank you, and I yield back. We thank the gentlelady for her questioning, and both the uh, ranking member and myself have some uh, closing uh, remarks and inquiries that I may wish to make at this time and then we will close the hearing. First of all, I'd like to thank all of uh, the members who have come and have been thorough, concerned, and seeking information to be problem solvers. Thank you so very much. With that, let me yield to uh, the ranking member. I thank the chair, and I appreciate uh, your, your kindness in allowing me to take a few minutes to speak and try to clarify a few things. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about the Coniglia case, which is the case that was referenced by Ms. Muller. Uh, that case was a case involving a um, Fourth Amendment seizure by police officers of a gun. Um, it was ruled 9-0 that there was a Fourth Amendment uh, right by that individual to have that gun and was taken from this home without a search warrant, without, uh, uh, without correct due process. And uh, it was not directly a red flag case, but it was a, a, a search and seizure. It turned on Fourth Amendment rights, not Second Amendment rights. But Justice Alito, in his opinion, opined that, quote, I'm going to quote this, provision of red flag laws may be challenged under the Fourth Amendment, close quote. He set the stage for red flag laws being potentially violative of the Fourth Amendment. That is, I think, something that we, everybody in here, should be concerned about. Uh, I wanted to get to something that was in the written statement of, of uh, Mr. Skaggs, and, and I don't think it was alluded to. People talked all around it, but I just wanted to get to this point. It was on uh, page three of your, your, your point, and, and I, I entered it only because I think it's a point of interest because we were talk, you were discussing suicides in here, and we've discussed suicides, and I think you said they were, in your written testimony, that they were about 60%, and I think... My data indicates it's 56%, and I think Ms. Muller testified 55%. But nonetheless, 
uh, suicide by gun is about somewhere between 55 and 60 percent of all uh, gun violence in the country. And, uh, but guns are used in only 5 percent of suicide attempts, but they are just much more effective than other forms of suicide. I think we all can acknowledge that, but I, I just wanted to clarify that because I don't think it was clarif clarified in the testimony. Uh, with regard to ghost guns, um, to manufacture a firearm that's intended for sale um, without a federal firearms license is, is already illegal. And that's important to understand and remember. Um, so if someone's manufacturing a ghost gun for the purpose of sale, that violates already current federal law. Uh, I, I also have a, a number of, of pieces. I mean, uh, Mr. Gutenberg mentioned that, that uh, the original testimony that we saw of Ms. Ms. Hupp was um, um, th there were not 400 million guns in the, in, in the United States at the time that she initially made that. And I think that's right. I think it's accurate. But she also testified um, three other times before Congress. Um, so the initial testimony, yes, that's the correct, but she also testified, and I would like to submit uh, two transcripts of her testimony, which contains the same, the essence, in essence, the same testimony she just gave that you saw earlier. Also, uh, a document dated May 11th, 2021, called In These 11 Cases of Firearm Save the Owner or Others. Another one from April 15th with the same title. Another one from March 10th saying, these 11 examples of a defensive gun use undermine push for more gun control. Another one from February 17th entitled 11 times a gun stopped matters from getting worse. Document um, entitled undetectable firearms. Um, another one entitled background information on so-called assault weapons. Another one entitled another ban on high capacity magazines. Another one in, in called that time that CDC asked about defensive gun uses. Another one, uh, entitled Priorities for Research to Reduce the Threat of Firearm-Related Violence. That's a series of, of documents I'd ask that they be admitted to the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now, I want to make one last point, and then, um, then I'll, I mean, there's so much to talk about. I, I really am sincerely grateful that everybody came in. I mean, uh, and we may differ on getting to it. I think there's some root causes that if we were to let down our partisan guard and our defensiveness, we might be able to, to reach some kind of uh, accord on some things that might work. But, and I, having said that, and, and I would refer people to, to Ms. Muller's written testimony, which does have a series of proposed um, remedies that she, she advocates for. But I, I remind everyone on this committee that just a week ago, our chairman wisely admonished our side from berating witnesses last week. Yet today, Chairman Nadler attacked Ms. Muller um, and uh, in, his, in his, his statement before he got in his questioning, before he went to ask anybody questions, he berated Ms. Muller. Um, and then I would say that my colleague from Rhode Island, Mr. Cicilline, um, in my opinion, he probably doesn't think so, but I think he misrepresented her view and then followed up by saying that those points, which were, I think were misrepresented, were lunacy. We've had one witness to say that arguments that disagreed with his are, quote, BS arguments, close quote. If you really want to get to, to a way to resolve issues, we need to move past this constant discarding of whatever the other side is saying. We, we are divided. There are two sides, but there are probably places of finding accord, defensiveness and um, at hominem attacks are not successful. And that's why I thank the, the gentlelady for reminding us last week, and I want to just take the opportunity to remind us a little bit this week on some of the talk, uh, talkers that we heard from, from some of my colleagues on the other side. And with that, Madam Chair, I thank you again for the opportunity to take a moment. I, re, I uh, yield back. I thank the ranking member. I wanted to extend to you the courtesies. I would just say for both of us, when members are out of the room, it's probably challenging for me to accept uh, critiques, so they're not here to either respond, but I thank you for your clarification. Uh, I, too, have some uh, concluding uh, qu questions uh, similar uh, to take within my time frame here, but I do want to remind everyone that we came today to discuss the unending crisis and to uh, find essential steps to reduce gun violence and mass shootings. 
So I have some quick round robin for witnesses um, that I did not get a chance to uh, indicate uh, a question, and I'll be very succinct, and I ask the witnesses to be so. I want to start with Representative uh, Goodwin and to um, just ask the question uh, that the potential of permitless guns, will that, in your opinion, produce more death and more bloodshed? Absolutely, I believe so. And would it make Texas a more dangerous state? I believe so. Thank you for your work, and we appreciate it. With that, I want to introduce into the record um, a, a submission by Moms Demand Action that works very hard that has indicated the number of police associations, the Texas Municipal Police Association, Texas police chiefs, licensed to carry instructors, faith leaders who are against this legislation, including Moms and Man Action, that will be submitted into the record very quickly. Pastor Grady, thank you. I'm sure you know many of the pastors in my community. You answered it, but I'd appreciate it if you'd say it again. Your daughter still suffers from wounds that she um, was a victim of during that heinous shooting. Are those wounds including mental challenges? And when I say that, her having to go through again so these are long-lasting impacts when you're a gun violence victim. Pastor Grady? Yes, Congresswoman, that is correct. Uh, those challenges uh, every day, uh, Michelle, uh, goes through the, the struggle with the emotional, psychological uh, baggage that came with this horrendous uh, attempt to take her life. And uh, she works through it. Uh, she is an advocate, of course, and uh, she is also uh, involved at uh, using her story uh, about uh, overcoming and, and, and being intentional about healing. So yes, the, the, those will be a part of her life and a part of our life uh, forever, I believe. But she's working through it, she's courageous, and uh, she has a great support system here in place as well as the other uh, survivors of this uh, horrendous crime that took place in our city. Thank you so very much. So the pain of those families who've lost a loved one and then the pain of those families who are now taking care of a victim who is resilient but still has this impact. Uh, Mr. Skaggs, yes. if I might, thank you so very much, Pastor Grady. If I might, uh, I've been doing this for 27 years longer because I offered the first gun ordinance in the city of Houston that was ever passed, and that was holding parents responsible for not storing their guns uh, and generating the loss of little ones in the home. Uh, can you uh, present for me legally the Second Amendment and its ability to stand alongside of those of us who are advocates for gun safety. Are we arguing against the Second Amendment when we argue against uh, ghost guns, argue for storage, argue for background checks, argue for banning assault weapons? Is the Second Amendment compatible with gun safety? I very much believe that it is. Uh, in the 2008 decision, it's District of Columbia versus Heller, uh, the court made clear that while the Second Amendment protects an individual right, it's not an absolute or unlimited right. It doesn't uh, extend a right to carry any weapon whatsoever in any manner whatsoever and for whatever purpose. Uh, and the decision specifically made clear uh, with regard to storage that nothing in the Second Amendment uh, is in conflict with laws that prevent child accidents by requiring guns to be stored. That's in the Heller decision itself. It said a wide variety of additional laws were also fully constitutional and fully permissible. And so what we at Giffords are trying to do is find the evidence-based solutions that will both save lives, that the evidence shows us will save lives, and are also fully consistent with the right to keep and bear arms. Um, I think, uh there are many articles consistent with that, and I would assume you would also add extreme risk orders are likewise not contrary to the Second Amendment. I understand, not understand, working with my local law enforcement, uh, they are heavily um, concerned about individuals' conditions, with certain conditions, having guns. Is yeah. that inconsistent? That is not inconsistent. Thank you. Let me submit into the record um, a study by John Hopkins that found strong support among gun owners and non-gun owners for more than 20 uh, gun violence prevention policies, including extreme risk orders, uh, protection orders. I will submit that into the record without objection. Uh, and then I want to take note of a 
renowned expert, David Hemingway, uh, not the Hemingway, but David Hemingway, that noted, uh, rather than rely on the blame game, the public health approach to reducing gun violence seeks to bring people and institutions together to get to work on the problem. It invites everyone to join the effort as part of the solution. My ranking member made that in his final remarks, and then I'm looking for us to be able to join together, maybe on the storage bill, uh, or other bills that might be helpful. But the scientific evidence indicates that all other things equal, places with stronger firearm laws have fewer gun problems and suffer fewer violent deaths than places with weaker laws. Let me conclude with you, Mr. Guttenberg, and let me indicate that your member, who's been so much a champion, um, had wait, uh, rain delay, uh, and that is, of course, um, Mr. Deutsch, who is a member of this committee, and he, he sends his uh, best wishes by way of uh, his staff. I want that to be noted on the record. But um, you suffered an unspeakable pain, uh, Congresswoman McBath as well, children being lost, another child dealing with it but living his full life. Uh, how do you speak to those who would suggest that your pain and advocacy is anti-police, that you are a defund the police advocate, uh, and that you cannot see the value of good policing, good police conduct? Uh, and I know there were some, uh, there are long issues that we could talk about, about response and, and schools, but, but I want you to talk about your pain as we conclude this hearing, and that you find, I don't want to put words in your mouth, uh, that your work is not inconsistent uh, with your ability to work with good policing, good police conduct, uh, and, and support uh, the idea of protect and serve, uh, but also uh, want to ensure that we end the proliferation of guns and bloodshed on the streets of America. Thank you so much for asking me that. Anyone who follows my story knows I am actually very connected to law enforcement and our first responder community. Um, anyone who follows my story knows my brother died, as have many first responders, because of his service in 9-11. Anyone who follows my story has heard me talk about the law enforcement officers who have been and continue to be a part of my life. I'll answer your question really simply. Gun safety is police safety. If we do more to deal with the reality of the guns and gun violence, we will save the lives of law enforcement. We will, we will save the lives of the members of our community. The less at-risk people feel, the less there's going to be a risk of gun violence. You know, it gets back to, I think, the earlier question you were also asking on, on extreme risk protection orders. Law enforcement really appreciates them for a reason, because it does help them take weapons from those who intend harm to others. Had extreme risk protection orders been in place before the Parkland shooting, it is likely that shooting never would have happened. It is the reason we passed it in Florida three weeks after Parkland. So what I would say to anyone who would suggest that because I believe in gun safety, that I have some aversion to law enforcement, I would simply argue I actually care more about their lives than you do. We care about the experiences that you've had as well. As I close this hearing, uh, we have many views in America, people who believe that police should be reimagined, and I respect them all, and funds should be used to help end violence and promote community groups. Uh, that does not suggest that uh, they are defunding, they are imagining and reimagining. We have all voices in this room, but today's hearing was about ending the crisis senseless crisis of gun violence. And that's what I hope we have garnered, and we will look at everyone's testimony and find common ground. And I hope my ranking member will take his own words, which is uh, to find a way that we can work together. I thank all the members that were kind enough to stay, and I thank all the witnesses that have presented us with an excellent record uh, that we can proceed on. I think the real question now is for us to get the job done. Thank you so very much. Uh, and this meeting is adjourned.